and we are live. What's up, everyone? How is everyone doing today? Welcome to the show. Welcome to whatever that we're doing. Uh, just real quick announcement, smash the like button. Do that right now. Because again, every time we go live, I've been noticing there are more viewers than there are likes, and that is unacceptable, and that's ridiculous, so you need to be smashing the like button. If you're new here on the YouTube channel, make sure that you hit subscribe. I know we shouldn't be saying this right away, but we're just going to do it. We're going to get it out of the way. But what we got planned today is we're going to be going over a debate that my friend just did with Matt Dillahunty. You know, the atheist guy, the guy who's known for saying claims are not evidence. Well, he went and had a debate where they said many things that were way out of my knowledge base. So I'm bringing him on today to basically explain exactly what went down. What does it mean? So we're going to rewatch the debate. It, when we watched it live, it got cut off. So it just completely vanished. So we're going to rewatch the debate. He's going to fill us in on the stuff that was missing. And then we're going to ask some questions. And hopefully, did I hit record button? No, I didn't. Okay. And hopefully, <laughs> shut up, fan. He's going to fill us in on stuff. I totally lost my train of thought. I always forget something. There's always an issue. Uh, but without, without further ado, what's up, fan? How are you, bro? Good. How are you? I'm good, man. How was I'm excited to be here? How was your How was your trip? It was tiring. Um, I'm an old man. I like to sleep early, and I like. Actually, it's not even that. Um, I like my routine, and when when my routine is broken, I get tired. How so, old, How old are you? Thirty. Th that That's not an old man, bro. I'm I'm a thirty year old with three kids. How about that? That's fair, but like I'm, I'm 33. So when you say old man, that makes me feel like trash. So you went across <laughs> and you, you had a, a debate with Matt Dillahunty and you did what, what, what the heck is this called again? What is this thing that you use to prove him wrong? Really quick. Am I supposed to be being seen on your, oh, never mind. That's how it works. Sorry, I'm looking trying to, I'm looking at the YouTube stream at the same time. <laughs> um, what was are you asking like what the name of my case is for the resurrection? No, the, the big fancy word that you use to the methodology? The what? The methodology, like the method that I used? Yeah, the method. Yeah, it's um I'm just basically using um Bayesian epistemology. So um all, the long story short of that is just um, it's a formalization or a mathematical expression of how people basically think at the end of the day. Like, that's all it is. Um, and so I just formatted the way our minds think into like a mathematical calculus. Um, used that kind of a structure as the structure of my reasoning. Um, and then from there, gave arguments for the reliability, reliability of the New Testaments. Um, which then tells you what the original witnesses of the resurrected Christ said, um, and then kind of ran the argument through there. And we can kind of elaborate on things from there. Yeah. So, how many people just fell asleep in the chat? I wonder. <laughs> I, I I feel like I did a good job there. <laughs> you did do a good job, man. It's just it's it's very nerdy stuff, and that stuff is super important. And I just like to pick on you. Uh, so, like I said, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to review this like live. Um, let's just speed it up here. And like I said, if we got questions, if anybody in the chat has questions, put in your question. If you want to guarantee that you get your question answered, give me money. That's the best way. I guarantee you I'll talk to you if you give me money. So I guarantee Than will talk to you if you give me money. So if, that's, if you want a guaranteed way to get your question in, that's the way to do it. What, what do you think? 1.25 or 1.5? Whatever you want. And yeah. yes, I'm only here to get John money. Amen. Um, so yeah, like I said, we'll watch a bit of this. And then when you're, my audio is way too quiet. Bro. Is that better? Hey, you sound fine to me. Uh, well, it's louder on TikTok than it. Why do you guys tell me this too late? How's it? How's that sound now? Is that better? Holly says it's good. Sometimes you guys just mess me up. It's good now? Okay. All right. Uh, okay, let's let's just do this then. All right. Check. Okay. You guys hear me okay? All right. 
Am I just going to start talking and you'll spend the time? Or else? Yes. Okay, cool. Good evening, everybody. My name is Stan Gustopoulos. I'm the founder of Exploring. What you keep, okay, here, that's something we're going to talk about right now, bro. Because <laughs> <laughs> here, here's something that you do that I, I think you shouldn't have done in the debate. Because I, I noticed that is you kept belittling yourself. W would you say I'm wrong with that? Oh, no, that's just self-deprecating humor. It's, it's not good, bro. It, especially when you're in debate. When you're in debate, you got to like, exude that confidence and like show people like you know what's up and, and what's going on so like i don't know like i think you mentioned your bald spot which is like not even there bro like oh you know i so the uh, full disclosure i just have massive like john you and i have private conversations and in a private com conversations i'll cook um as the kids will say but in the public i i have like major imposter syndrome mm. and um i used to really struggle with like arrogance and pride and so um now that i don't struggle with that as much i almost i'm like terrified of being seen as prideful and so that's probably part of the reason i do that too said so the self-deprecation well hyper says look at that man on stage he's got a body of a greek god so and i mean you, you are a greek uh would you tell everybody your full name or no? Yeah, it's uh, uh, Athanasius, uh, Christ, Athanasius K. Dot Christopoulos. My <laughs> parents, I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. On uh, my birth certificate, my parents, my middle name was supposed to be Costadinos, but they put K. Dot. So my legal middle name is K. Dot. It's like, uh, it's like Kendrick <laughs> Lamar. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's keep going. In reality, I want to start by thanking Crossman Church. I'm really humbled to be on a stage. And I'm ex exceptionally humbled to be sharing the stage with Matt Dillahunty, somebody who's had tons of experience. Can people hear this okay? Because, like, the audio is so, cool, like, pretty can, quiet can on my end. Can you hear it? Yeah, I can hear it. It's on max volume. Like, it doesn't get any louder than that. That's can fine. everybody in the chat, can you guys hear it okay? Yeah, Hyper saying the YouTube is too quiet. Oh, uh, did we just... Oh. Where'd you go? Uh oh. Technical issues. He just vanished. I'm right here. Oh, you're back. I didn't do anything. You just vanished on my screen and then you're like, Oh, I'm I'm not here anymore. Now now you are here. Hold on. You're not on my screen anymore. Bro, I can't I don't see anything. I can't I can't anymore. It's technical issues with me. That's that's my problem. I always got technical issues. You gotta just get StreamYard. It's not even the StreamYard. Sometimes it's just like at home stuff. Um Bro. Bro. I can't I see can, if I, um, Do you want me to see, see if I can't just snag the footage? Hold on. And then I can increase the volume on it manually. No, that's there you are. Now you're back. Why didn't it work? This is the worst live known to mankind now. I spent an hour setting everything up beforehand to uh, to make sure everything works. It was, it was my, my fault. fault, probably. And then, yeah, now you're all like extra zoomed out. Now, now John, John is <laughs> <laughs> And now I got an, a weird echo. Do you want me to keep, keep talking? talking? No, I just want things to work, bro. That's that's what I want. Have you tried? Have you tried? Oh, now oh, I now hear, I hear that echo. Yeah. Somebody, 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 somebody gave, gave you thirteen ninety nine super chat to fix, fix your, your broken, broken system. system. 
A- amen to that, bro. Um, thank, thank you. you. We, we need, need the, the m- money to exercise the demons, demons out of John's, John's tech. tech. All right, I, I fixed the audio. Okay. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> I spent an hour said doing all this. You're, you're right. I just need to spend the money on StreamYard. Oh, oh man. man. This, this is great. Is great. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's it's actually the worst thing ever. Because, like, I'm trying to do this, like, for real in life. So the fact that this stuff keeps going down, like, just ask ask the people who watch me regularly. There's never a live where there isn't some sort of technical issue. It's a common, super common thing. All right. Where the hell are you here now? I I have no clue. Gotcha. Bro, okay. It's done. Let's go. Uh, just a heads up. There's going to be a lot of times we're going to reference things on the screen, but due to time constraints, I won't be reading them in full. There's so much to go over, so the slides are going to do some extra work for me. Tonight's debate is about the resurrection of Jesus, and before I get into that, I need to hit on some preliminaries that will help us put everything together. After that, I'm going to present four main points. The first and main point, the probability that the resurrection happened is higher than the probability of its competing theories. That will be argued in three, in light of three other main points. The prior probability of the resurrection is not too low to overcome with a reasonable amount of evidence. Point three, the New yeah, Testament is historically reliable go. and contains what the eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus originally said. And then lastly, the combination of the evidence from the testimony of the eyewitnesses and the other historical considerations favors the resurrection. So anytime we want to know if an event happened or not, we need to ask three main questions. What is the prior probability you can just, of the event? You can just pause it whenever you want. You want. You have, you have events, given our background knowledge, next we need to ask what are the odds of the evidence we would have if the event did occur? Then lastly, what, are, what is the probability of the evidence we have if the event did not occur? Here's the basic idea. Prior probabilities are important because they tell us how strong the evidential case needs to be. If the prior probability is low, then we need a high strength of evidence. If the prior is high, we only need a little bit of evidence. The last two questions help us evaluate the strength of the evidence through something called the likelihood ratio, and that's something I'll cover a little bit later. So we have to uh, tackle a fundamental question here. What is evidence? Um, a short summary of the positive relevance definition of evidence is that a data point is evidence for a hypothesis if it makes that hypothesis more probable. Here's an example of how this works. Imagine you're walking in the woods and you see a rusty, broken down cabin. Now ask yourself, are there people staying there or not? The prior probability that people are staying there might seem low because people tend to not sit in rusty, broken down cabins. But as you- uh, YouTube, is that better? Is that better for the audio? I fixed Sans Echo, I got it now, sorry about that. Oh, I didn't even know I was echoing. No, it was on just on their end. Better for okay. the audio, good, okay, fix it now. So uh, yeah, this one's simple, right? You're just going through the cabin to show how Bayesian works, how you'd figure out yeah. the probabilities. Yeah, yeah. Any, no, no questions on that? As you get closer, you do see lights on, smoke coming out of the chimney, shoes, and other signs of occupation. While you don't see Some people, people are saying the lights, the speed's smoke, too and fast. shoes are all data points that are much more likely on the condition people are staying in the cabin than not. To be clear, this principle isn't something I've made up. This is a consensus amongst philosophers of science and evidence. Now, what would be evidence for a miracle? There's a lot of different things we can point to, but the main thing I want to focus on today is testimony. For anyone skeptical of this, consider that there are people that specialize in epistemology, the study of knowledge, and we have a subset of that study called the epistemology of testimony. The philosophers who focus on this are not rejecting testimony as evidence. In fact, as Jennifer Lackey says, testimony is an ineliminable epistemic source. Were we to refrain from accepting the testimony of others, our lives would be impoverished in startling and debilitating ways. So if testimony is valuable evidence in our everyday lives, it can therefore be evidence. So I don't, I don't know if you do this, but would you give like an example why testimony is valuable in everyday lives? Like most people would say, like, yeah, yeah. 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 So in my original, in my original, like putting together of the um, opening statement, I just had to condense a lot of spot like points. Um, I actually had a few examples. So for instance, one of the most primitive examples you might have, for instance, is um, say you're like three years old um, and you want to know who your parents are or where you came from, right? Mm -hmm. What evidence do you have as a three year old? other than the testimony of your parents for your own origins. Well, you could do like a DNA test. Find right, out. but you're a three-year-old. Are you really going to understand that? Well, no, not as a three-year-old, but like if we if we go like I'm older now, I'm an adult. Yeah, yeah. no, no, and that's totally fine. The, the question though is there's, there's case examples of where testimony is super valuable and the, the value of the example of like a three-year-old is you're in a spot where you can't actually, you don't have the cognitive functions to, to investigate those things. And so 
the epistemologists, the people that study knowledge when you're justified in having knowledge and stuff like that, um, the epistemologist is going to say, yeah, the three-year-old is epistemically justified and warranted in believing the testimony of the parent. Um, another example might just be something like this. Um, we accept pretty pretty easily the testimony of um, particle physicists as they're looking at like the quantum world, like the quantum like mm -hmm. level stuff, right? I can't do that. Um, for all I know, they're just fudging all the numbers and fudging all the observations and everything. Um, but I'm taking their testimony at face value. If I have a doctor who tells me I have um, a disease and I have to buy a bunch of uh, medication, right? Um, he might show me the lab tests. But do I know what the lab tests are actually saying? Yeah, you're not right? going out and doing those lab tests yourself. Exactly. And so these are all instances of testimony where we believe pretty like pretty important things. Um, and so just kind of think of those everyday examples where you just you're just you're, the knowledge that you have is based off testimony. Um, your science textbook based off the testimony of the scientists who have the science of the work that they've done and things keep going and going and going. So testimony is a very valuable piece of evidence. That doesn't mean that all testimony just proves whatever claim people are making. Right. But the quality of the testimony is important and stuff like that. I, I love, uh, I got a super chat while you were talking from a Kevin Clark that says, can't watch tonight, but use this for some it classes. 1999. Shut up. Thank you. But sh <laughs> shut up, bro. I'm trying out here. Like I, I got everything working and it just, I, some glitch always happens. The, the testimony that I like, like the one where it's like testimonies work. I use the, the example of buying a car. Like, um, the only way to prove that I bought, like if you see me drive home tonight in a Ferrari, I know we don't live near each other, but you see me driving a Ferrari. you be like, that's mm -hmm. wild, John. Where'd you get that Ferrari? I'll be like, I bought it. And you'd be like, what's the evidence that you bought it? And I show you a receipt. And it's like, well, how do I know you didn't forge that? Then you'd have to go get the testimony of the guy who sold it to me or get the testimony of the dealership. The only way to prove that I actually bought a Ferrari is through testimony. There's, there's no other way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's keep going. For whether or not a miracle happened. Now I want to shift to another focus, disconfirming competing hypotheses. If a certain data point is unexpected, if a miracle did occur, it helps us to actually confirm a miracle. And this is where that likelihood ratio comes into play. Now, this ratio is the answers to our last two questions. What are the odds of the evidence if the, if the event occurred? And what are the odds of the evidence if the event did not occur? The output of this ratio tells us how strongly the evidence supports one hypothesis over another. This is why we ask those questions, and this is why a mixture of evidence for the miracle and against the competing theories is I love important. The camera work here. This again, not something I made up. It's common practice in multiple academic disciplines to focus on this likelihood ratio, whether it's science or history. Now, did you guys, um, when you guys did this, did you, were you, uh, did you guys trade information first? No. No. So he, uh, he had no idea what you guys were going to be talking about or that you were even going to go into Bayesian? No. Somebody told him. I don't know who told him that I'm going to be giving a Bayesian case. But I offered to him, full disclosure, I told him that we can trade um, openings and rebuttals. Um, he said no? Yeah. Oh. Uh, do, you, do you know why? Um, he doesn't. So, yeah, he just doesn't prep for debates um, up until like the last week or so. And so he just kind of he's just a busy guy. He kind of just shows up, <laughs> shows, shows up and says, I'm not convinced. Sorry, I had to do that. I had to do that. <laughs> Here's an example of how this works in a non-miracle case. Let's go back to our cabin example. All we're saying is that the odds of the evidence, that is the smoke, the lights, the shoes being there, if people are staying in a cabin is very high, while the odds of those things being present if nobody was staying in the cabin is very low, so it's more probable that, the, that people are staying in the cabin. Now I want to move on to some definitions. Laws in nature are simply descriptions that tell us how nature behaves when it's left to itself. A miracle, by contrast, is an event that would not have occurred if nature was left to itself. There are clearly detectable deviations from the laws of nature produced by a divine agent that the certifies slides a religious are off, claim. by the way. Um, so whoever was handling the slides was just over like he was just he was just given way too much to do between moderate monitoring the stream and the video and everything like that so so there's gonna be times like this where the slide isn't matching up with what i'm saying mm. so this is not what you're talking about yeah so like then it's actually supposed to be the next slide and okay. the next slide just has the definitions i'm giving okay that's all 
game. Now this is important because many times skeptics like to use the uniformity of the laws of nature as evidence against miracle counts. Someone might say, dead men stay dead, therefore the resurrection probably didn't happen. The proponents of this sort of argument find their roots. Yeah, see. Yeah, okay, so this would be a good so spot. Sam Harris, welcome to Within Reason. Yeah. This would be a good spot for us to go into the rest of your statement. Yeah, um, so let me do this. This might be helpful. Do you want me to just pull up this? Do you, wait, show, uh, I forgot where it picks up at. Can you show me there where it's Yeah, we can show you at? that. Um, let's go... in the events described. And this also implies that the author of Luke Acts was a companion of Paul. Wow, wow, that's New really Testament scholar Craig okay. Yeah, like, dude, it was, you were, you were not live for a hot minute. Like, it, yeah. it was a while before you came back on. We, we were pretty, we were pretty annoyed. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, we have a lot to go over then. Um, so do you want me to just kind of, do you want me to just brisk through? The basic points that I'm making. No, no, I want to hear what you said. First, like you don't have to go like through it like as you would the debate. Like, yeah, but yeah. I, I don't don't skip things. Like, I want to, cause like like it was just getting juicy. Like that was just pretty much your introduction at this point. Yeah. So I feel like we missed the like the meat. Like we got the 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 piece of bread, some some cheese, and then missed the meat yeah. and got another piece of bread. I'm sharing my um screen. Can you see this? Uh, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> the, the problem is I don't know how I'm going to bring that. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, no, we're good. We're good. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, so let me just get to, um, testimony disconfirming. Uh, hyper, how's my audio? Is it better? I turned it up. Wow. Okay. So there was a lot of slides missed on the thing. Um, just so you know, like this, like this slide was up, um, showing how you do likelihood ratios. Um, if you want to go over any of these things, we can. But was this this was at the start? Yeah, this was this was this was before it cut out, but they just didn't show the slides. Okay. So, because like if you remember me talking about disconfirming competing hypotheses, right? Then I go, this is why where likelihood ratios come in and why we ask the questions we do. So basically, the top, the top portion of the, the numerator is the probability of the conjunction of all the evidence supposing a miracle occurred, and you divide that by the probability of the conjunction of all the evidence supposing a miracle did not occur, hmm. um, and that gives you like a likelihood ratio. So if you put numbers in there, the closer the number is to zero, the more disconfirming it is of a miracle, and the closer it is towards infinity. The more confirming it is of the miracle or the event that in general that you're looking at so like when we talked about this privately for a while just for the sake of the chat yeah. can you give like that example of like hey what is the probability of like i think we did like yeah i actually i actually go over i actually go over it with just the cabin example okay Beautiful. so right so it just can let's just can let e equal all the evidence in the cabin example so smoke from the chimney lights shoes C is the con C is the hypothesis that people are staying in the cabin, and that not C is people are not staying in the cabin. So the top equation translates to what the probability of the evidence on the condition that people are staying in the in, in the cabin. Uh -huh. and the bottom is uh, pro the probability of the evidence on the condition people are not staying in the in the cabin. And let's just translate that to everyday normal speak. Like, what are the odds that I would have shoes, smoke, lights? stuff like that if people are staying in a cabin that seems to be really high right like if people are staying in a cabin i'm going to expect to see those things and then the bottom is just what are the odds of the evidence if people are not staying in a cabin well if people are not staying in the cabin i'm going to expect to see none of those things so the probability that i see those things is really low and then we got uh, one question coming i think is a good one comes from Roger, says, uh, how do you assign numbers That's yes um so i answered this question in the q a a little bit but um, it depends on who you ask. Um, there's a lot of debates about, because what we're doing is something called epistemic probability. Um, we're not working with stats and we're not working with physical probabilities here. Um, so the subjective 
um, so there's like subjective accounts of this and there's objective accounts of this. I, I fall in line with the objective accounts. And the basic idea is just like, look, you can give these qualitative ranges of the degrees of support the evidence gives of the hypothesis. Um, so like, for instance, in this example, there's high and low. I might translate that to 0.9 or 90% and 0.1 for 10%. And a one would um, be like, it's guaranteed, right? 0.1. Well, no, like if something was like, absolutely, it's going to happen. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I misunderstood yeah, you. Yeah, um, so, so like if I jump yeah, off a building, 100%. the chance of me hitting the ground is like one. Yeah, that'd be an entailment. Right. So it'd be like logically impossible. Right. Um, And so... Now, 0.9 or 90% is just like an idealization of what I mean when I say high. Um, or 0.1 is just an idealization of what I mean by 0.1. We're, we're just kind of getting close to what we really are trying to say here. Um, and then so there's there's a lot of really funky stuff going on in the background when people point and put in more numbers and more precise numbers. But for the sake of the debate, I didn't do any of that because... We just don't have time to get into all that. Right. Okay. That makes sense to me. This should, this cool. everyone in the chat keeping up. If they're not, just tell me, just, just tell me, to, just tell me to shut up and I'll shut up and uh, you ask I, me I questions. Think I think you're good, bro. Keep going. Cool. Um, okay. So I define the laws of nature as descriptions that tell us how nature behaves when it's left to itself. A miracle, by contrast, is an event that would not have occurred when nature is left to itself. They're clearly detectable deviations from the laws of nature. Okay, so this is where it cut off. Everybody, everybody's favorite 18th century Scottish philosopher, Hume. <laughs> David Hume. Um, so basically here, I just kind of alluded. I didn't read this in the debate. I just had it up and then I kind of dumb and then I just popularized what Hume is saying, which is pretty much like, look, um, the laws of nature are evidence against miracle claims. Um, dead men stay dead. So probably Jesus didn't rise from the dead is kind of like the argument that people will make. Right. Um, there are other inter interpretations of what Hume is saying here. Some people might say Hume thinks that miracles are impossible. Um, but I just took the more uh, modest interpretation of Hume here. And so uh, if there's any questions there, not, if there's not any questions there, I'll just kind of move on. So, um, so I asked ahead. you this question when we talked about this before. Um, if somebody says that like the possibility of a miracle happening is absolute zero, like how do you respond to that? Why? Miracles don't happen. There's how no evidence of miracles. How do you know that? Because we've never seen one or witnessed them. There's no, there's no uh, empirical That's a black swan evidence. fallacy. What's that? That's a black swan fallacy. What's a black swan fallacy? I'm just playing the atheist here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, um, just say, like, for instance, that you live in a, con in, a, in a country and you've only ever seen white swans. And you say, hey, I've never seen a black swan before. Therefore, black swans don't exist. Right. But, but we could say that miracles don't exist because that people have looked and searched and they found no evidence. There's none whatsoever. Yeah, and so then the, then the other questions like, okay, who is who is all, who is they? Because uh, over eighty percent of humanity <laughs> attests to some sort of supernatural claim and experience or miracle claim. The, so the, this is the problem of paying devil's advocate because, like, I agree with you and that makes sense, but I can just I can <laughs> hear the atheists in the distance being like, "Well, that's just nonsense. Miracles don't happen." Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so the argument is like you're right. This like you're the steel man is is still like a circular argument, right? Um, there's a much better way to steel man it um, called like neo human humanism humanism, um, but I don't actually think it works still because basically what they try to do is they'll just say, hey, miracles are just so infrequent of a claim that the prior probability of a miracle claim is super low so low that no amount of evidence could over overcome it and what would that be um, like like if you were to put that on the scale of like that zero to one what would that be what would they say it's be I th typically they don't say anything <laughs> like like this is the problem i actually prepared a mathematical proof against yeah, you didn't that present too. it i was mad oh the, did i show you the mathematical proof yeah, that i had right yeah right, you right? Show, you even you even show me memes that people made of it um, <laughs> 
and but you never posted it. I wanted you to post that in front of them and be like, I didn't hey. want to show that huge equation. I can show it for your audience if you want, but um, well, if it's if the time is right, if not, wait till we get to the point. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that this is the, basically what what goes on. Um, I didn't, and then I had my other mathematical equation in, in the back pocket if Matt wanted to go down a neo-human route. So yeah, that's the argument. So the question, so then there's this slide, I'm just saying like, look, there's been a, a lot of responses to Hume. Um, the bottom guy is an agnostic named John Ehrman. Um, and he writes a tons, tons of, about tons of issues about Hume's argument. Um, so John, you wanted some math. So here's the basic idea. Here I gave a mathematical disproof of Hume's point. Um, and here's the basic idea. Um, the equation just reads, if the probability of a miracle, if miracles, if the probability of a miracle happening, um, given a, the, uh, given a uniform laws of nature equals one, then the probability of a miracle happening given the uniform, um, laws of nature is greater than or equal to the prior probability of a miracle. So if that's the case, then, um, this can't be used as a miracle because they can't, I mean, this can't be used as evidence against the miracle claim because it doesn't lower the probability of, of a miracle claim under the prior prior probability, if that makes sense. No, you lost. Me. Okay, that's totally fine. Let me just, and this is why I have the here's what the math means th okay. section, right? Because we keep thinking about things in terms of expected versus surprising, okay. right? On the condition that the hypothesis is true. Right. So like just like with the cabin example, um, it's expected that if people are staying in the, in the cabin, you'd see shoes, smoke, water in the table, stuff like that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's very surprising that you would see those things if nobody was staying in the cabin. Right. Right. OK. Now let's go back to now let's, let's translate that to miracles. If miracles, if, if laws of nature are just the way nature behaves when left to itself, and miracles are clearly detectable deviations from the laws of nature produced by a divine agent, right? Then is it terribly expected on the miracle hypothesis that nature behaves the way that it behaves? No. What? Like it, it would be expected to see that nature behaves. Yeah, it'd be expected. Yeah. So now is it unexpected that you would have uniform laws of nature on the condition that miracles happen? Is it, say that again? Is it unexpected that I, you would have the uniform laws of nature if miracles happen? Is it unexpected to have the uniformed laws of nature if miracles happen? Yeah. So like you shouldn't expect the uniform laws of nature if a miracle goes down. So like I shouldn't expect a tree to start flying in the air if miracles happened. Is, is that kind of what you're saying? No. So basically all I'm saying here is uh, let me all I'm saying is, look, it's not surprising that if if somebody was healed, right, that in the background there's uniform laws of nature happening. Right. That's all I'm saying. And so because it's not because it's expected that these things that the uniform laws of nature are, are going on given miracle hypotheses, and it's not and it's not unexpected that uniform laws of nature are happening given you, you uh, miracle hypotheses, then it can't be used as evidence against miracles. That's all. I think I. <laughs> I think I understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to keep up, bro. I, I'm um, trying. I, I told you I, I'm stupid. So, no, no, you're not stupid. Okay, give me a second. I have a. I wrote down something here that. Uh, la 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 la. Where'd it go? Okay, here's what I wrote down. The fact that our ordinary experience tells us dead men stay dead cannot be a significant piece of evidence against the resurrection. Because miracles could not function as a sign without the backdrop of stable natural order. Um, the laws of nature functioning as they usually do in most cases is not surprising on the miracle hypothesis. Does that make sense? Here, I'm going to make something. I'm going to do something on the spot to, to make this even easier. Hold on. I'm going to make this really easy. Hold on. Am I the chat? Hold on. Does do you guys get it? Because like, if I'm the only one that doesn't get this, we'll move on. <laughs> um, maybe it's just the sentence because I get the Bayesian thing that you're talking about, the probabilities. Mm -hmm. I just don't understand this sentence. Well, while you're 
chat is telling you. Yeah, okay. So they're with me. They're not getting it? They're not getting it. Totally fine. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something that should help you guys understand this a little bit better. Oh, my Pretend you're not seeing me set this up, okay? <laughs> no, you're good, bro. Yeah, I could I could take it off the screen if you want. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Okay, so now here's my slide. You see it? I see a black screen. Yeah. Okay. Um I have I have a sign here for you. Okay. You can't see it? I can't see it. I can I can see a black screen. So what's the probability that I have a sign here? Uh I'd say you know, unless there's technical issues, probably like a 0 0.0001. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now that's the kind of the whole point. Miracles are meant to function, to function as a sign against the backdrop of a stable natural order. Right? Yeah. Oh, so it's like the, the life raft analogy. So now here's what happens, right? Here's my backdrop of a stable natural order. But now I've given you a sign that you can actually see because it's a clearly detectable deviation from the backdrop okay yeah i'm on board so does that backdrop of the stable natural order the black screw the black behind the sign is the, is the representation of the laws of nature right and my sentence hume was wrong is supposed to be representative of the miracle right right, right. so so uh, trent horn talks about this he said uh they had the 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 life raft or whatever it is it's bright orange because it's supposed to stand out against the whole yeah. ocean that that's that's the idea right I haven't heard his example, but yeah, that's the same thing I'm kind of pointing at here. Okay. So like the blue of the ocean is not evidence against the life raft, the orange, like the life raft, like the orange is clearly sticking out. And in the same way, the laws of nature are the way they are, but a miracle happening with those things in the background can't, those things in the background aren't evidence against the thing that stands out. The right. whole entire the point of it standing out is because there's things in the background. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. There you go. You got it. Cool. I got it. Yeah. So basically, yeah. And so, um, this was just, cause a lot of people will try to object to that. And so I just, I showed that this is a disproof of the argument mathematically. So basically the whole point is like, look, if you don't like that semantic expression or that, um, analogy we just gave, whether it's the lifeboat or the sign, this is, a, you're, you're also going to just going to have to deny basic math. If you want to say laws of nature, evidence against miracles, that's all. I, I get it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, clear. Awesome. Um, now we're going to move on to prior probabilities. You guys, you guys ready? Uh, Chad, are you ready? <laughs> are, are you ready? Use small words and speak slowly. Yeah. So, so prior probabilities, um, it's just the probability of the event happening or a hypothesis being true given what we know about the world already that's all yeah so for instance go ahead sorry i was just gonna say so it's like you know if i told you i got a dog uh knowing that people get dogs probability is a lot higher than if i said i got um a dragon yeah yeah um or, or in go let's go back to the cabin analogy that i gave right um you walk into the cabin you see it's rusty and broken down right and and then after you observe that you ask the question are people staying in the cabin or not, right? What I know in my background about modern society is that people don't stay stay in rusty, broken down cabins with the roof falling off, right? Yeah. What I know about cabins that are like that is that they're typically abandoned. So it seems like the prior probability that people are staying there is really low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what we're saying, what we're investigating when it comes to the prior probability of the resurrection is given what we know about reality what are the odds before we look at the evidence um that jesus rose from the dead low yeah and so um i actually would it depends on what you mean by low right because like the skeptic might say something like well it's infinitely low right which they're gonna have a huge burden of proof if they say that right because they're basically saying it's impossible 
which means they're going to have to argue that God, like God, God cannot exist. It's logically impossible. God exists or that God could not possibly intervene or anything like that. Um, and so I don't want to get outside of the opening statement. You can, you can, we can ask questions no, you're good. about some of these things too, unless you want, we want to get outside of the opening. Um, basically though, here, I just kind of say like, look, um, even if I can't grant that the prior's really low, um, my case doesn't hinge on it. We still have to look at the evidence. And so doctors, Tim and Lydia McGrew, for instance, I can't highlight on here. That sucks. Um, but doctors, Tim and Lydia McGrew argue that, um, the prior probability of the resurrection would have to be as low as 10 to the negative 43rd power. Jeez. And so I actually like outline how many zeros that is. Well, how did they come up with that number though? Yeah. So, so <laughs> I'll just say this. Um, they, they didn't touch the prior probabilities. So when you're doing Bayesian calculus, what you can do is actually look at something at the likelihood ratios of of the resurrection given the from the evidence so do you remember that likelihood ratio that we went over in the beginning mm -hmm. we're like looking we're like what's the odds of the evidence given the, given the hypothesis over the odds of the evidence given competing hypotheses yeah. right yeah i remember that so what they do is they look at all the evidence for the resurrection sequentially and they get to the posterior number of just the evidence um coming out and the likelihood ratio is the uh, the odds of the, of the, the odds of the resurrection happening um over the odds of the resurrection not happening being 10 to the 43rd power does that make sense what i just said there yeah but i i don't i don't like i don't think they, they get to the 10 to the 43rd right yeah because, so because the way you explained it it's just like low mid high so 10 to the 43rd where does that number yeah yeah from? Um, and so you just remember that those numbers are idealizations of what they do, of what like they're like what they're thinking. Right. And so they get that number through, again, really involved math that I don't know if you want to get into here. Um, if you guys are interested in looking at their case and how they do that, um, there's this textbook called the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. And then their section is called The Argument for Miracles. And you guys better get that textbook and make sure it's red because we're going to be doing a quiz here at the end of the <laughs> month and and we're going to go over it. it's going to be homework guys it's going to be homework so get that done good good yes that'll be a quiz um so yeah don't and so remember the other thing too is they're not just like hey all we have all of this evidence and i'm just going to slap on this number um, what they do is they look at the evidence sequentially. So they look at one data point, get the likelihood ratio. Then they look at another data point, get the likelihood ratio. And you just keep on sequentially updating the, the likelihood ratio until you get to this end result. And once you get that end result, basically what you get then is the inverse of that is what they're doing is they're back solving. So they're saying, look, if the posterior or if if the if the um, likelihood ratio of the evidence c given the resurrection is really high, it's, it's this number, then the prior probability needs to be this low in order to say that the prior probability is so low that there's not enough evidence to make the resurrection more likely. Does that make sense? What I just said there. Yep. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm on board so far. Cool. So basically, all like the main point here is like. Look, the evidence is really strong. And if you want to say that the prior is too low for the evidence to overcome, you're going to have to say it's something like this. And if you're going to do that, you better have a really good reason why. That's all. Right. Um... Uh, you good? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Can I just buy my way out of the quiz? Who's this guy? Um, what? Who's this, this is guy? Richard Swinburne. Is that Swinburne? I've never actually yeah. seen him. Um, okay, so then here is where I go into an argument for why the prior probability is not going to be that low. Um, and I, I, I'm giving a really modest argument here. Um, I'm working with some philosophers on an argument where it would actually really jack up the prior probability of the resurrection, um, like really high. But that's low key right now. For this, I'm just kind of outlining 
a few reasons why, if God exists, we can modestly expect that he would perform a miracle like the resurrection. So here's the backdrop of this, like kind of the fundamental layer. If God exists, he's perfect. Perfect beings will pursue the best kinds of actions. So if God exists, he will pursue the best kinds of actions. That should be pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. So um, then we discover that God taking on human flesh would be a best kind of action and what the life of God incarnate would look like. Um, I think you're jumping steps here. Huh? How do you get to the point where God would take on flesh? Yeah. Uh, so I give three reasons why I'm um, in, in the, in this section. And there's a lot of reasons why actually that I, I just, for the sake of a, a, a 25 minute opening, I couldn't get into. Um, so I kind of gave three pop level re re like reasons. One would be to provide atonement. Um, cause independent of Christian theism, uh, people have in moral intuitions and they understand that they've done moral wrongdoings and that they need to be made right with God, whatever that might mean. Mm. Um, various cultures all around the world have this intuition regardless of their theology. And so one reason why God might become incarnate is to provide atonement for humanity. Um, being a perfect, um, being a perfect sacrifice or whatever atonement theory you want to hold to, right? Um, in order to defeat sin and death on our behalf and make us in right relationship with God. Um, another one would be like solidarity. So in my opening statement, I kind of just outlined the fact that um, I'm, I have some friendships with people from when I was a firefighter, for instance, that will never like be really paralleled by any of my other friends because of the type of solidarity that we've been like that we've established because we've seen some horrible things, nearly lost our lives together. Um, and that'd be another reason why God would want to become incarnate to enter into solidarity with humanity. And another pop level example would be like, um, God, hum humans need um, help with knowing what to do, how to worship God, how to live right lives, stuff like that. Um, and sure, we could learn these things through revelation, like scripture. We might even learn these things through prophets, right? But what better way to learn how to live a perfect human life than by having God incarnate live a perfect human life on our behalf? Um, so like, those are just three pop level versions of like reasons why he would become incarnate. It's not a proof that he would here. Um, now, now that you're like going more into this kind of like a sideline here, um, Dillahunty really didn't address your argument. No, he didn't. No. Like, um, like that we missed a lot. And like, here, here's the thing, like, if I'm going to be honest with you, uh, I was talking to a mutual friend of ours and we were talking about like how it went down and we were like, Opening went to uh, you and then Matt's opening, Lake's opening. You took the openings, even with the limited that we heard. Then Matt took the rebuttal. And now that I'm thinking, but now that I know more of what's going on, I don't think he took the rebuttal anymore. Really? Yeah. I'm that, curious to know. That was our I'm initial instinct. Um, well, 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 we'll get through it when we watch. Yeah, we'll get through it. Yeah. So, okay. So then the other step of the, this other step um, is what you would expect God incarnate's life to look like. And this is really important because then if we have these criteria of what God incarnate's life might look like, um, then we can actually have this wide reference class narrowed down, right? Of So we have this reference class of potential candidates throughout history for God incarnate, and we can keep narrowing it down through these criteria. So, and there's, there's independent arguments for all of these. Um, but the big ones would just be like, for for instance, line D, I say he would show that he believed himself to be God incarnate. He would actually claim to be God. Um, he would teach that his life and death provide atonement for human wrongdoing. Um, we would predict that he would found a church to spread and pass on the news to all cultures. Um, and again, in, we have independent reasons for thinking these aside from Christian tradition. Um, I think he would vindicate that all his message through some sort of miracle and it would be something that would make it obvious that his claims were true and that his promise of liberation from sin and death would not hold us as it wouldn't hold him and then i kind of add my own little sidebar here which is by the way like hey look if you have a if god if god becomes incarnate and he's promising us deliverance from death itself what better way than vindicating that claim by him defeating death itself mm. 
right? Yeah, yeah I'm on board. Um, and then I also add another thing of my own, which is like God incarnate would enter humanity as the pinnacle of human history and kind of shifting the course of humanity, which um, if you're familiar with like Tom Holland, right? Yeah, so Jesus th this did. is the idea that he entered when he actually ended up reaching the most amount of humanity because of right. you know, farming and all that started and we had a huge growth right after Christ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so the next stage of this is basically, look, like Jesus is the only candidate that fits these descriptions. Buddha doesn't fit it. Muhammad doesn't fit these descriptions. Amen. Like <clears throat> there's not a single candidate out there aside from Jesus. So um, at this point of the debate, I make explicit, I made explicit. I can actually just read what I, what I said here if you want. Yeah. Um, let me just find it. <clears throat> so I said, while I find the evidence supportive of God's existence, let's send a spirit of modesty, consider a neutral stance on the topic. So to be explicit, I'm using the existence of God conditionally here. So to pause there for a second, right? I'm not saying God exists in this debate. I'm taking a modest position and saying, hey, we haven't argued whether or not God exists. So let's just assign a 0.5 probability. Just meet in the middle kind of a thing, right? Um, now, obviously, I think the probability of God existing is very, very, very high. Yeah. So my case for the resurrection outside of this debate would be a little bit different. But I'm trying to make modest arguments. So to try to meet Matt halfway, that's all. Um, so I'm using the God the existence of God conditionally here. And I'm just saying, so even if there's like a modest likelihood that if God exists, he would choose to become incarnate for the reasons we've outlined and subsequently validate his this through a significant miracle like the resurrection, then the prior probability of the resurrection of Jesus wouldn't be so low that it couldn't be reasonably supported by some evidence, especially when considering Jesus's unparalleled fulfillment of the criteria we gave. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm on board, man. Cool. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, that's my argument for the prior not being too low. Um, I'm of the mind that the priors, I, I, well, I'll, I'll save that for another time. How about that? Okay. <laughs> um, so then here I say, I, I'm kind of point, I'm making a, um, a rhetorical point here, which is look, um, I've given reasons for why, uh, the prior is not going to be too low for the resurrection of Jesus. And if somebody wants to object and say the prior is low, not only do they have to rebut the argument that I've given, given, but they're also going to have to give a reason for why the prior probability is zero or at least very close to zero. They can't just rebut the argument and then say, hi, it's zero, it's, it's really low. Um, that doesn't follow. All that follows is that the argument didn't work. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, so, would, they would have to actually like, you're putting a burden of proof on them. Exactly. Yeah, they can't just say, I'm not convinced. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Is this where it started? Uh, we can we can check. No, because I think we missed. We we started at, it starts at Luke's prologue, doesn't it? Well, let's, let's, this slide. let's have a look. Uh, that can go away now. Luke's prologue, point three. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll move up to that point then. Okay. Okay, so then <clears throat> then I transition to point three, which is like the reliability of the New Testament. Um, and so I this is one of the reasons why I got bummed out about the stream cutting out, because the comment section is filled with people saying, oh, fans saying the, are like the New Testament's reliable on names, therefore the New Testament's reliable on resurrections. I make explicit that, that that's not the inference I'm making. Yeah, the, the, the comment section was uh, was not the... Not the nicest place in the world. And I probably contributed a lot to that. Uh, I wasn't the nicest in the comment section. Oh, no. <laughs> but I was trolling. I was I was like, all right, these guys are going to come in and troll my buddy. I'm going to troll them right back. Let's do it. That's uh, fine. So so before I get into New Testament reliability, I make explicit. The argument I'm giving is not saying the New, New Testament's reliable. Therefore, the resurrection happened. The, the argument that I'm giving is, look, the New Testament authors are reliable. They do history. They do it well. They intend to portray accurate, reliable history based off eyewitness testimony. Therefore, the testimony that we have of people that claim to have seen the risen Jesus 
written in the Gospels is the original testimonies of people that claim to see the risen Christ. And it's this is really so and I don't say this in the opening statement for, for people that are listening. This is really different than what you might be used to with the minimal facts argument. Because minimal facts argument is just saying like, hey, that the these people had experiences and they believed that they experienced the risen Jesus, but you don't get to go into like the, the obscure details of the testimonies or anything like that. And you'll see that in my opening. And that's why this is important. That's all. Cool. Uh, is that it? Can we get into the video or no? Um, no, because we got to get to gospel authorship. Okay. So man, we basically a lot, bro. Yeah, I know. It's really annoying. So um, there's two types of evidence that I go over internal evidence that shows the New Testament contains the texture of a historical document that includes reliable eyewitness testimony and intends to portray accurate history. And then there's <laughs> external confirmations, which show that the authors got hard things right, that someone that was not close to the facts would have hard, had a hard time replicating. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. So for authorship of the Gospels, um, you guys already, probably already know this, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark is the interpreter of Peter, Matthew, a tax collector, Luke, a doctor, who is also a traveling companion of Paul, and John, a disciple of Jesus. Um, and so I just kind of go through three tests. It's not the most in-depth argument for traditional authorship, but um, it's fine for an opening statement, right? I just, um, I just read this in a book today. Petrie's book? Uh, I don't remember. Fair enough. Yeah. This is this is Brent Petrie's um, list. Basically, though, because a lot of people will like to say, like, look, the um, we have the Gospels were assigned the names later on kind of a thing. Right. But every single piece of manuscript data that we have of the Gospels that are um, that include the type that include the titles or include the beginning and ending of the scrolls. Not a single one of those. Um, are anonymous. Every single one of them have attributions. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, though. Couldn't um, couldn't the skeptic argue that the gospel according to doesn't mean authorship? It just means this is the gospel according to them. No. No. I, why? <laughs> well, <laughs> because we have all this other evidence that corroborates it. If you just look at this in a vacuum, sure. Right. Yeah, th that's what I mean. Like in the vacuum. Could, like, well, yeah, could, we see, could we see like a document that says, this is the gospel according to Billy Bob, but Billy Bob didn't write it. I'm writing it down according to what he said. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Of course. Okay. But but do we ever look at evidence in a vacuum? The and atheists is it right do. to do that? What? And the atheists do. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. But scholars should not do that. The scholars so, do. <laughs> I know. I know. Actually, you're right. And that's, that's why I have a lot of issues with scholars. <laughs> Damn, uh, no, excuse me. Pardon me. Um, Test two, um, it, here's the basic idea. Um, we have across the Greco-Roman world, spanning over 26, over 2,600 miles, right? Universal attestation of who wrote the Gospels. Christianity at this point is a persecuted minority. Um, travel super dangerous. And you don't have any reason to lie about this kind of stuff. You get the point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you're not in a place to like, hold some big conspiracy theory and they also don't have zoom or skype Internet, or any of those types of data i don't even did they even use carrier pigeons back then i don't know that's I don't, a really good I, don't, question. I don't think they did bro i don't think probably they had not carrier at pigeons. least the christians didn't um and on top of that we have i didn't go into this in the opening right but this is what the data looks like for the gospels can, can i just gotta pause you real quick um i'm assuming it's john john is left log on to his church's page and he's calling us sexy <laughs> i assume it's john i don't think it's one of the other uh other people at his church coming in here it's the it's the head pastor <laughs> <laughs> um uh, man that's funny so i didn't go into this in my opening but um you can actually contrast this with like the epistle of hebrews um if you were to like chart out on a map um people's attestation of who authored hebrews it, it's all over the place right so we know what it would look like if the original authors were not known for the gospels and it's not what we see yeah yeah i, I was actually thinking about this today i'm actually planning on doing a video specifically on that topic um and because that's what i've been looking into the fact that they come to the conclusion of anonymous authorship 
to me at this point is kind of ridiculous. Like I, I don't I don't really you, see a really you know valid what? argument for it. You might like okay, you and I had a private conversation of this, so I'll just kind of keep it at this. Um I've been reading a really fun book about like his like the philosophy of historiography. Hmm. Um, and it's really confirming a lot of the stuff that I actually said to you um, the last time we talked about how scholars make really bad methodological mistakes when they're assessing evidence and trying to support their hypotheses with like such limited data points. So remind me to send you that book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I w I'm going to put it on my soundboard now. Uh, Michael Heiser, when he says, I wish scholars took a yeah. course in... Um, in epistemology or philosophy or basic yes. logic. I forget what it was. You mentioned one of those things because they do seem to kind of like miss that and just jump to conclusions. Like, of, yes. of course we dated at 70 AD because there's no way he could have predicted the destruction of the temple, even though I all the evidence points that direction. I, I, I had a brief ready on that, but I have a video on that. Um, I think you can have, I think you can explain it naturalistically. The, that is the prediction of the destruction of the temple. Well, yeah. that, that's a conversation for another day. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I think this is going to take us a while to get through. So yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so then test three was just like, look, um, the document. If the documents contain data, that would be surprising. If they're not written by the people that described, that's evidence for traditional authorship. So, like for instance, Matthew's an alleged tax collector, and he was clearly focused on wages and money and stuff like that, and actually gets things about money right that are condensed to the time frame of the historical Jesus and the geography of the historical Jesus. Um, John knows knowledge shows knowledge of Palestinian geography. Mark has knowledge of first century Jewish customs and has Peter's and Peter's role in Mark is like, has Peter front and center. Luke was written by someone who was trained in physicians terms. So like, for instance, um, I just give all these down here, but I didn't give it, go into them. So basically it's like, look, if Luke was a doctor and he wrote the gospel, you wouldn't expect to see these Hippocratic terms. Do you want to hear a fun fact about uh, this time period's uh, physicians' philosophies that I learned the other day? Sure. They thought the sperm had a direct connection with hair. So how much hair oh, you Oh, dude, had? don't get me started. I you know this, this? is why. I, oh yeah, I know this. That's why. <laughs> that's why. That's why I laugh whenever people like try to tell men not to have long hair, because Paul's quoting, like Paul's using Hippocratic um, biology in that verse so oh, hold on because i just learned about it so now now i gotta dive in why can't they okay, have okay. let me just give you like, I'll, I'll give, give me a quick bird's eye view quick, we, quick, we quick can talk up. about this um here's a bird's eye view um think back to um the the whole nephilim thing like the angel sleeping with women thing mm. right okay keep that in mind bro's like Here's we'll make this quick goes all the way back to the nephilim i know <laughs> here so hair is a reproductive organ, right? Um, it's meant f hair in the ancient under under like Hippocratic thought was thought to absorb the fertilizer men give to sperm. Okay, I can say that word here. Okay, yes. So hair is a sex organ, um, and sperm, uh, and and absorbs sperm. So that's why women were told to shave their pubes and have long hair because the long hair <laughs> this is how they thought okay um the long hair would be i like to, that it would would help the semen get absorbed up into the head to help them get pregnant and that's what they thought that's also the reason why men w had like short hair and they had long pubes because they wanted the, the semen to be where it's like ready to be shot out okay long hair is meant is like a, a sign of fertility in the ancient world. And so when Paul says that like, it's a shame for men to have long hair and, and says women should be covering their head, right? Right after he says that, he says, because of the angels. Referencing the Nephilim. I keep going. That That's the whole point. So basically <laughs> Paul's like saying like, look, Hey, you're a guy. If you have long hair, it's a shame because you should be reproducing, right? Yeah. He's not shame as like a moral thing, right? It's just kind of like, oh, shame, like blah, blah, blah. And then when he tells women to cover their hair, it's like, well, look, hey, if you don't cover your hair, look what happened with all the people with the long hair back then, yada, yada, yada. Basically, you've now, um, you've now officially debunked Christianity 
because you've, <laughs> you've now shown that the Bible is not a trustworthy historical source, and this only can mean that the Quran is the word oh, of God. Oh, stop. Okay, we're moving on. <laughs> so, um, I, now we're at the Luke's prologue thing, so I think we're good. <laughs> yeah, keep going, keep going. No, I think we're good. Now we're at the Luke's prologue thing. Uh, oh, so we can watch the video now? Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, bro. <laughs> I uh, I was watching uh I, I was watching David Wood last night, so like his impressions are in my head. So I just kind of like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> I, felt so I felt led. I felt led. All right, led by the People. spirit. Next, scholars widely agree that the author of Luke is also the author of Acts. Regarding Acts containing eyewitness accounts. Scholars often cite the we passages starting. What's that? I don't hear anything. You don't hear it? No. Uh, sh chat, can you hear it? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sharing with you, I don't think. No, I'm sharing. Chat, where, could you hear the audio when I was playing it? Yeah, you can hear it. What's what? It's you. What's your issue? I don't know. Is it showing up on your screen? Yeah, just go ahead. It's fine. Uh, hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll do this again. No, uh, yeah, we, we do, do. There we go. Can you tell me if you hear it now? Starting in Acts 16.10. Yep. Okay. Here the author uses the word we in a way suggesting personal Oh, no, this is not the where they describe. Started. They're and just this behind also my slides the again. What's that? He's, uh, the slides were just behind. Um, so hold do on. you have more to say? Yes. Okay. Sorry. No, you're good, bro. Do you, are you pulling up your slide again? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, my slide's up? Yep. Okay, cool. So, um, at this point, this argument is for, like, to show that the intention of the authors of the Gospels were to portray history. So, I look, I use um, a friend of mine named Luke Vandeway. He's a New Testament scholar. I used his translation of the beginning of Luke's prologue. And so the basic idea here is like, look, historians can actually compare Luke's approach. And when I say Luke here, I'm talking about the Gospel of Luke. Luke's approach to history, um, to the hit, to the approach that other ancient historians like Thucydides, Josephus, and Dionysius took. Um, and they note that like Luke is pretty unique because he actually like puts himself in proximity to the sources. He uses language like accomplished among us, delivered eyewitness accounts to us. Um, and says things like, I have an informed familiarity with the events in question. So he's like, pos he's positioning himself as somebody with inside with the inside scoop based off eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. He's not claiming to be an eyewitness, but he's trying, he's acting like a historian. Um, and then I draw a parallel to um, another historiographic work called Against Olympiodorus, and a guy named Demosthenes says, the quote that I have here. Um, and so the basic idea here is like when you look at Luke's opening and you look at what Demosthene says, they're using really similar language, um, calling like to put themselves as an insider with the, of the knowledge and putting themselves as like in a, a knowledgeable authority on the things in question. And if you look at Luke's prologue and compare it with Demosthene's speech, the key words are actually um, really are significant parallel significantly paralleled as well um so for instance like um the word alicia which is like truth um is in both accounts um eyewitnesses which is uh, i forget the word off the top of my head but like all the greek words are pretty much the same here um so this parallel serves as evidence of what like luke's intentions were um and that luke is like asserting himself as a in a, as a unique position um, to tell us the truth about what happened based off eyewitness testimony. So this is a preempt to the typical objections that you hear whenever you talk about gospel reliability too. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, the Spider-Man fallacy, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but for the sake of the chat, go over it real quick. Sure. So somebody might say like, oh, okay, well, the, sure. The gospels now get a bunch of names and places, right? Um, therefore the resurrection happened. Well, by the way, spider-man gets the tower of new york right so therefore spider-man exists like that's the right yeah um but if you have a clear historical 
evidence that the Gospels are trying to portray themselves, the authors are portraying themselves as historians, portraying what actually happened versus a comic, uh, the Spider-Man art fallacy or objection just falls apart from the scene. So that's yeah, no, no, nobody looks at the Gospels and does not consider them like historical by any means. Like you'll never see anybody in academia look at Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and say, well, this is just a fiction story. Yeah, exactly. So that's the basic basic point there. Um, can okay. You, can you full screen on yours? Can you get that full larger, screen? Like what do you mean? You, you had it larger last time. Did I really? Yeah. If not, it's fine. Yeah, don't, don't I don't know how to do it. We've had Sorry. too many technical issues as it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And then for the Book of Acts, um, I think this is where we're at, but I'll just say this just in case. So we're going to have to come back. Um, basically, scholars all agree that whoever authored Luke also authored Acts. That's because of the shared address to Theophilus in both books. And the Book of Acts refers to a last book. So there's a connection between Luke and Acts. Um, I, we've already argued that the author of Luke is Luke. Therefore, the author of Acts is Acts. And then we have things, what the scholar, what scholars call the we passages in the book of Acts. Um, and I have the references on the screen there. So the basic idea there is just like, look, when you look at these passages, um, this tells you that whoever wrote Acts was a traveling companion of Paul. And they had, there were like firsthand witnesses and stuff like that. And I think from here, we can actually get back to the stream. Okay, we'll pull that up here. I don't know if there's any questions there, but. Uh, no, I don't see any super chats, so. Cool. Give John money. <laughs> the author of Luke Acts was a companion of Paul. New Testament scholar Craig Keener highlights the significance of the wee narratives in Acts, suggesting they reflect the narrator's firsthand experience. Moving on from just internal cues, we also have many external confirmations. For example, classical historian Colin Hemer wrote a meticulous book, and in it he presents 84 factual confirmations that bolster the credibility of Acts. While we won't delve into each detail for the sake of time, these confirmations encompass a wide array of accurate details that are best explained by the source of these writings being historically reliable eyewitness accounts. I can't fit 84 on the screen. Here's five uh, for, to start. Another external confirmation of the gospel. What are you laughing at yourself for? I'm not I'm not laughing at myself. I'm laughing at the fact that um the slide that was supposed to be there isn't up. <laughs> Hyper just gave me 1999 because he says that you told him to. Appreciate good, you, good, Hyper. Good. He's the goat. Uh, Gospels comes happens. in there. I haven't I haven't watched this through, so we'll see what happens. Don't don't get don't get embarrassed. You did great. Oh no, no I'm not embarrassed. I'm just a little frustrated that the uh, slide isn't there. Well, John's here, so you can yell at him. Yes. Form of knowledge of personal names. This is known in the relevant scholarship as onomastic congruence. That was the slide that was this is particularly there. significant, considering the diverse and nuanced cultural landscape of the Greco-Roman world. Isn't the right slide, A recent though, study though. by Luke Vandeweghe points. What's that? This was the slide that was supposed to be there for the external confirmation thing I was just talking about. So we're just going to tell the chat: don't look at the slides. Don't worry yeah. about it. Just pretend they're not there right now. It's okay. just. Uh, it's just. Uh, just stand talking. Listen to his sexy voice. Points this out. Take a look at this table, which compares the top 12 Jewish male names. It offers insight into the naming conventions during the time frame of 30 BC to 90 AD. When we look at the data, the occurrences of the names in the Gospels and Acts line up with the top names. This is remarkable because the data we have for the names and places in other pl in time. Oh my gosh, other no, names and places and don't line up with the names we have here. For example, there were many Jews in Egypt in the time of the New Testament as well as Alexandria. But as you can see by this table, Jews in Egypt had a very different set of names compared to Jews in Palestine as found in Jewish inscriptions from there. And the same goes for Jews in Libya and Western Turkey. Not only that, but when we contrast the Gospels and Acts with later less reliable works, we observe a significant disparity. These later accounts are incongruent with the naming conventions we saw, indicating a lack of accuracy and attention to detail in the portrayals of names and identities. For example, we have the second century Gospel of Judas. This just has two names suitable. Next time you do this, um, you should request to like, control your own slides. Um, I wanted to, so the problem is there's just so much stuff to go through that, but, but like a little, just a little controller and just like, yeah, I know I'm using my laptop here and my, all my notes are on my laptop and I swipe. Right. And my laptop can't multitask. Well, but I mean like their system, it hooks up to their system. Oh, and they just give you sense. a controller. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Next, 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 next. And then you don't have to worry about it. Suitable for Palestinian Jewish names, Judas and Jesus. However, introduces a great many names that are not consistent with the conventions of that era and region. In essence, if the New Testament accurately reflects the historical context of Jesus' time and place, we would anticipate consistency with the naming conventions of that era and region. Conversely, if the authors were detached from the Jesus' time and place or providing an accurate history, we would expect naming conventions divergent from the norms of that period, akin to what we observe in the text like the Gospel of Judas. Therefore, since the Gospels are, inconsist are consistent with the naming conventions of that era and region, this is evidence that they're reliable. So I've given a case for the reliability of the New Testament, and now I want to reiterate. I'm not saying the New Testament's reliable, therefore the resurrection happened. What I am arguing again is that the New Testament's reliable, and, the, and that includes the accounts represent what the original alleged eyewitnesses actually said. So now, now here's the part where the chat blew up, and everybody in the chat, I remember I was there, everybody in the chat, it just like, whoosh, all from top to saying? bottom, and they said, there are no eyewitnesses. And that's, that's the downside of like missing everything that happened before, like your entire argument, right? Well, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because like as soon as we hit here, I just remember everybody, no eyewitness, no eyewitness, no eyewitness. And then, and what annoyed me is there's, there's like people I knew who were in there. And I like, I expect you guys to have like a, a little bit better understanding that you missed out on something. And he probably argued that, but yeah, it, that one frustrated me personally. Yeah, I yeah. couldn't imagine how you felt on that. I wasn't paying attention. Well, obviously you weren't chat. seeing the chat. You didn't go back and look? Not really. I looked through a little bit, but it was like more towards the end or during the cross exam. Fair enough. Uh, Hyper asked a good question, actually. Do you think there's any argument Matt would accept now that you've talked to him on a personal level? I don't know. I like I I... I'm still trying to get a grasp um, on his epistemology. So I'm not sure um, because him and I have very different approaches to like knowing what's true and what's not true. Right. And I'm not sure where we disagree and agree yet to be able to answer a question like that. I, I, I personally, like, I don't know the guy, but if I'm going to, say anything based off what i've seen from watching him for years i'd say no and i think a big yeah. reason for that is just like he is so committed to this in his life now it like this would be like equivalent of somebody being a christian for 60 years and then coming to the conclusion that god's not there it'd be like detrimental to the, like their whole lifestyle and everything they understood so in my, i i don't see anything short of like a, a uh, what do you what did you call it a, a Chris, christophany happening yeah i think a christophany I mean, is the only thing that would change him i'm look i i had i think i think matt would change his mind if i think matt would change his mind if he was shown good reasons for why he shouldn't hold to the methodology he holds to um and then given the arguments in that sequence um but I'm not sure. Like I don't have I don't have access to his mind no. or you, anything you, like You that. only know a little bit about him. Um, this, this we're only three minutes in. This is two hours, so let, let's let's push through. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm gonna be looking. Uh, chat, you're just gonna have to live with it. We're going up to 1.5. It is what it is. Oh hey, Rob's in the chat. What's up, Rob? Looking at specific historical evidence for the resurrection, and while we go over the points, remember the preliminaries I mentioned in the beginning. I'll be showing confirmations of the resurrection and showing why the competing theories are less likely. And one last note is that because I've argued that the New Testament is reliable, that leaves us with two theories that actually can compete with the resurrection, that either the eyewitnesses were lying or they were mistaken. To be clear, there's other theories you can hold than these, but without a takedown of the New, of New Testament reliability, that won't work. Now, the initial point to consider, obviously, is Jesus' death by crucifixion, for Jesus to have risen. And I think this is a very good point that you just brought up. Um, you made, oh, you made an argument. Theory thing? What's that? The competing theory thing I said. Yeah, yeah, because you made you made an argument, um, and I think I think it's a very solid argument. You made an argument um, saying this is why it's reliable. You have to bring something to the table to say it's not reliable. You can't you can't just sit there and say no. -uh. Like you have to yeah. present something and say this is why we can't trust it being Luke. This is why you can't trust it being Matthew and Mark and so on and so forth. So I, I think. One thing I really enjoyed about how you did this debate is that you really made it so that the the skeptic or the atheist has a burden of proof. And I think they get away with that a lot of the times is that they don't have the burden of proof. So therefore, all they can do is just sit back on their heels and say, I'm not convinced. But you've given a situation where that doesn't really work. Yeah. Yeah. 
he must have been dead. Uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion is the consensus among scholars and supported by abundance of evidence. Um, but after Minimal facts argument caught you. After that, <laughs> Jesus died, after Jesus died, he was shortly thereafter buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And as a reminder, we've established the reliability of the New Testament, and the empty tomb is attested multiple, multiple times. The Jewish leadership was not happy with this movement, and they could have easily produced Jesus' body to stop it from progressing. But this never happened. The location of the tomb would have most likely been known by most people as well, and we have multiple lines of witnesses. Here, here's one that we, we could touch on real quick um, about like the empty tomb, because a lot, a lot of people argue that the, the tomb is protected because the Gospels claim it's protected, and we can give the right that's trustworthy. But is it not possible that they weren't? Sure, it's possible. What, what do you think? Like, if you're going to do your Bayesian probability, what would you say? Like, it's that that it was that it was protected. That it wasn't protected. Right. And then they just put it in there to seem it more probable when they actually went and stole his body. As like an apologetic, you yeah. mean? Yeah. I mean, so I think it was protected. It was probably Jewish guards, not Roman guards. Um, there's a whole argument for that. Um, and I don't see a reason why I don't see a re I don't see any positive evidence to say that the the that the um, guard motif isn't like a later developed apologetic. Um, cause that would be, that would be what the hypothesis has to be, right? right? It would have to be a later, a later developed apologetic and or a redaction. Um, and I don't see any good reason to, to say that, especially in light of the fact that we have things like, um, the, the reliability of the new Testament, the intention of honesty, all this other stuff. Um, and on top of that, the sources I cited in section 108 of Justin Martyr's dialogue with Trifo and section 30 of Tertullian's the shows, um, have enemy attestation of these Jewish guards and everything. So it's like, why would the Jews hold up this story of the, the, the disciples stealing the body while the guards were asleep and stuff like that? Yeah, that makes sense. Like, like if there, if there were no guards there, what I would expect to see the Jews to be do is something like, Oh, you guys are making crap up. Like <laughs> you stole the body. There was no guards, but that's we, not we what would expect did. somebody in history to go. No, we never guarded that. You guys stole yeah, the body. Exactly. Like we don't know what you did with the body. But we have you the stole complete it. opposite. We have a we have a complicit, we have an implicit endorsement of that mo of that. And that, story. that was wrote by who? Josephus or Tacitus? Um, Justin Martyr dialogue Justin with Martyr. Tripo. But Justin Church Martyr really. is like what second century though. Yeah, that's fine. So how how would he know? The sources that so his dialogue with Trifo. Oh gosh. How about we save that for another one? Because we're sure. going to, that's going to get, that's going to get into church father stuff. And we're going to, like you said, we're only like four minutes in here. Okay. Yeah. We'll do that another day. Furthermore, as you can see by the screen, we have multiple enemy attestations of the empty tomb as well. It was also discovered by women, marking them as the first witnesses to the resurrection. This is significant because first century Jewish Palestinian culture had a low view of the testimony of women, specifically their testimony to miracles and divine revelations. For instance, Jewish law often disregarded the testimony of women, considering it unreliable due to the boldness of their sex. Their words, not mine. And as you. <laughs> Did you, did you see the, you didn't see the chat. Everybody in the chat at this point uh, was like, oh, the misogyny argument, the misogyny argument, the misogyny, yeah, yeah. misogyny is like, you're missing the point. Like, anyway. And see, yeah. there's references I, on the screen again. It's, it is what it is. It is what it is. This satisfies the criterion of embarrassment, which is, princi which is a principle used by historians to assess the reliability of historical accounts. It suggests that if an embarrassed Women, just so you know, it's embarrassing when you give a testimony. Anyways. ...sing or socially awkward details included in a narrative, especially one that would be detrimental to the author's or group's credibility, it is likely to be authentic rather than fabricated. And this doesn't just apply to authenticating one or two events involving women. It enforces the reliability of the whole document because it tells us that they were dedicated to telling us what actually happened, even if it hurts their public case. Next is the testimony of the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. People claimed to have experienced encounters with him after his death. The witnesses are not uniform groups of religious zealots. They are diverse, they're from diverse backgrounds with different educations and social standings. Here, I present a table detailing these recorded appearances. Aside from the appearance of the 500, the number of unique witnesses goes up as high as 21. This leads to my next point. As you can see by this chart, the individuals who bore witness to the resurrected Jesus didn't just catch a glimpse of him. Their experiences were rich and multi-sensory. They didn't just see him. They heard his voice, felt his touch, engaged in conversation with him, and even shared meals in his presence. They include times, places, and even reactions of the, of the witnesses. And they claim to have even heard Jesus himself tell them he rose from the dead. And each of these testimonies has some bearing of independence. As Dr. Lydia McGrew says in a 2020 article, when we get into the details, we see clear marks of some independence in the accounts. Their testimonies are not bare assertions that the event happened. They include details that interlock with each other, suggesting credibility. And they include details that others do not, which suggests some sort of independence. These combined factors bolster the credibility of the testimony and are evidence against collusion. To entertain the hallucination hypothesis, one would need to posit an extraordinary scenario. It would be an instance where everything we know about hallucinations would be suspended with one individ with individuals experiencing the same exceptionally rare polymodal hallucination over 40 days, despite lacking an anticipation of Jesus' resurrection. 
This hallucination would need to be uniform for all witnesses, imparting identical instructions. Uh, so allowing in the chat asking for that chart I had. If you want that chart, just shoot me an email, than at exploring-reality.com, and I'll send it over. Physical interaction and even sharing meals in such a consistent, widespread hallucination on at least 10 different occasions with at least 21 unique witnesses across a 40-day timeline seems to me to be a miraculous event in of itself. Moving on, we have, we have the conversion of Paul. Because of the reliability of Acts, we can have confidence that this is Paul's actual testimony. This next point is very important. Paul claimed that Jesus not only identified himself, but also explicitly endorsed the teaching of the very people. But Paul is a false prophet. Come to drive Christians away. <laughs> you should know this. They wanted to take, he didn't, he wanted us to eat Inshallah. pork. Inshallah. <laughs> Paul was persecuting by saying, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul then, given the overwhelming and explicit nature of his experience, the partial mutualness of the experience between him and the companions, and its occurrence while he was wide awake, as his companions could attest, quite understandably concluded that it was real, and hence that Jesus really had risen from the dead, as preached by the Christians. Furthermore, these individuals would have expected a hostile reception when they start, started spreading their message of the resurrected Jesus. To the Gentiles, the Christian message would have been repulsive, worshipping a man shamefully executed on the cross and believing a physical resurrection, an idea contrary to the prevailing pagan beliefs of the time. To the Jews, the idea of a crucified Messiah was scandalous, shattering a long-held expectation of a triumphant leader, and Jesus' death left his followers in disarray, fleeing So, I just want, like, for the chat, he, you're, you're given, like, an argument that a lot of people have heard before, right? We, like, this is a very familiar argument, but you're doing it in a way where it's like, we're taking this... Point, we're adding it to the probability. We're taking this point and adding yeah. it to the probability, this point. And if we keep doing that, we end up with this number that gets higher and higher and higher. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, my argument's not the minimal facts one, especially with those appearances and all that jazz. Uh, my use of Paul was very different than the typical minimal facts approach. Um, and then I don't, you don't typically see the anticipation of hostile environment or anything like that in the minimal facts approach. Um, the next section you will, though. Okay. Persecution and facing shattered ideals. If they were going to make something up, why make something up that they knew would cost them socially and physically with no earthly reward? Indeed, many of those who claim to have witnessed the risen Jesus not only anticipated a hostile reception, but also willingly endured suffering and even death for their belief in the resurrection. Both Christian and non-Christian sources can confirm this. And as I stated earlier, Paul himself admits to being a persecutor of Christians. It's more plausible that they suffered and died for something they sincerely believed and experienced firsthand, rather than a fleeting hallucination or fabricated story. And an important side note here, these early Christians suffered not for a mere belief, but for what they perceived as an empirical fact, having witnessed to the risen, to the risen Jesus because they were in a position to know the truth. Finally, let's get into our main points now. Remember the questions we needed to answer. What is the prior probability of the resurrection of Jesus? What are the odds of the evidence if the, if the resurrection happened? And what are the odds of the evidence if the event did not occur? In summary, our case began with establishing the prior probability of the resurrection not being too low. Then we ex examined compelling evidence for the reliability of the New Testament, which contains firsthand testimonies of the resurrected Christ from the original eyewitnesses. These witnesses endured hostility, suffering, and even death for their proclamation. And we have testimonies from at least 21 unique individuals, including skeptics like James and Paul, across over, four, across over 10 occasions, spanning 40 days, all corroborating the reality of the resurrection with an empty tomb to back it up. This is exactly what we'd expect to see if Jesus had risen from the dead. But now ask yourself this, how likely would it, would it be to see these things if Jesus was dead? If you're unsure about this, let me give you an example of what things would look like. Simon Bar Kokhba was a Jew. And this is the question I ask atheists all the time. And like people, the only answer, like this, this is the crux of like, um, I'll go on a little bit of a tangent here. This is the crux yeah, of like ahead. most, um, most, most people will like argue tertiary things in the Bible and, and they'll go like, you know, what about slavery? What about, um, you know, did God have a dad? Um, the, these types of things. And that that's fine. But if we get to the crux of like, why did people believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead? The only argument that I ever get from the atheist is people believe crazy things and die for it all the time. Well, yeah, but they only believe tr things that they believe are true. There's no naturalistic explanation, none whatsoever, on why people would genuinely believe they saw Jesus rise from the dead for 40 days. And this is like, I feel like this is like the point of Christianity. I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis who said, um, no, Paul said something along the lines, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our whole, our whole religion falls. And then C.S. Lewis talked about that as well, produces bones or something along those lines. I'm misquoting. Yeah. And, and this is something I kind of wish that more, and I'm glad you did this topic against Matt because we, we often get caught in the weeds when reality, we could just step in front of somebody and be like, okay, what about the resurrection? Like, how do you explain that? And, and you can yeah. hand wave and say, I don't know. And that, that's fine. But the probability is like, like you're showing probability. The probability is for us. It says, yeah. this is true. Jesus Christ died and resurrected. And then bare minimum, bare minimum, you can't look like the, the atheist can't look at a Christian and say, you're irrational for believing this. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they're just, they're just kind of, kind of being an ass, in my opinion. You want to add on to that or no? 
No, um, this is just what I'm about to go into here, too, is like something you don't typically hear in resurrection argument cases. All right, let's do it. Jewish rebel military leader who was. How's your time, by the way? Because like I said, this I'm is... good. I'm good. You got time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. my wife, my wife and kids are in bed. OK, I don't know if you got to get up early or nothing. So, all right, I'm good. Hailed as the Messiah by his followers. After his execution, what do you think happened? Do we have any testimony of a resurrected Messiah? An empty tomb? The short answer is we have nothing. His movement died out as a stark contrast to what we see with Jesus. And this is only one example. There are many more, as you can see, by the list of other quote-unquote messiahs who died out on their faith with no claims of resurrection. Um, so therefore, we can come to this conclusion. The evidence strongly confirms the resurrection of Jesus. When we look at the likelihood ratio, the data is extremely favorable for the resurrection and very, very unfavorable to the competing theories. Now, I want to say this. Uh, if Matt wants to interact with this argument... One minute. If Matt wants to interact with this argument, or anybody... John, where are you on the chat? I got to ask you a question. Hold on. John's in the chat. John also said Than hated the topic. And by the way, full disclosure, I hate resurrection debates. So that's why you're so quiet when I'm on my rat. You're like, John is so wrong here. John is so what? wrong. Because well, the whole rant I just went on was about how we should focus on the resurrection. So why do you... Why oh, do you no, 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 no. So I actually, I agree. We should focus on the resurrection. I'm saying in a debate format like this. Right. I don't like resurrection as the topic. Why not? Because New Testament reliability is its own topic. Miracles, oh. epistemology, God's existence, prior probabilities. Um, you get the point, right? Like, Yeah, you got to go through a lot. All of those are their own separate debate, and you can't really hit on much. That's, okay. why, that's why I don't like resurrection debates. That makes sense. John, why the heck did every time you speak in the microphone, you were trying to make yourself sound like super manly? <laughs> that's my question. You have one minute remaining. This is, this is like this is what I kept hearing every time John spoke. Uh, John wants to the conclusion. What's that? John is very manly. He, he is. I was actually shocked. I seen him on camera. I thought you'd be skinnier, bro. You got, you got a little something to you. You thick boy. Not like not fat. That's not what I'm saying. Which is not true. The objector must do one of or combination of the following things: um, argue that the prior for the resurrection is so low that the evidence can't overcome it; attack the data itself; attack the explanation of the data by giving, or by giving a better one. And if we stay within my methodological parameters of this case, this logically exhausts the options. Now, to be clear, Matt can bring his own methodology to the table, and that would need to be defended, but my argument must be interacted with on its own merits. So if these things are not met by the end of the debate, we can reasonably conclude that the resurrection is the best explanation of the data. Thank you for your time. So Matt's we'll about right to get there. into his, and, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't, I don't think he really prepared like a, a, a proper... Uh, intro like I know he's not supposed to and I knew this at the time I know he's not supposed to address you in his opening statement like what you said because you guys didn't know but like it just it, it felt like all over the place it didn't feel like it was on the topic it was kind of like to me it just I, I feel like this is one of his worst openings I've heard in my opinion and probably not the worst but it's like one of the worst I, I was not a fan of it but like i said i think he did a really really good job on the rebuttal so i'm not just being a matt hater here yeah i i well yeah so before we get into his opening um i was i was having a really hard time tracking it um that's part of the reason why my rebuttal sucked because i was just like like he was bringing up a lot of like points and I was just trying to like connect the dots, but it was really hard for me to follow. That's but not me saying that's the thing. He the... wasn't connecting points. He, he was going from subject to subject. He was, he wasn't staying on subject. That's what drove me nuts. Yeah, I was, it was a very hard opening statement to respond to, but, um, it, it, there, the points are relate. Like, I actually think the points are related. He just didn't make the, the logical connections explicit. I don't think they were, but we're, we're going to watch it now. And we, we could talk yeah. about that, but I, I really think what he gave was a shotgun argument, right? Where it's just like cock back, boom, and hope something hits. And that's, that's what I felt like happened in this opening statement, which again, when you, when you don't have a burden of proof, you, you can do that. And it works because you no, he saying, actually starts the, his opening by saying he'll take the burden of proof. Did he? Yeah. Okay. You'll well, see it. Let's do it. I must have missed that. Please welcome Matt Dillahunty for his opening statement. We, we can give him some props on his beard and his coat, though. He looked awesome. He, he won fly, points. Bro. And 
and and and this moment here is like I do actually really appreciate this because the two of you actually showed some genuine respect for each other, which, like I said, is really nice to see. But unfortunately, in, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think it's like as fruitful as it could be. Like it's fruitful yeah. on like the 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 personal level, which might be what God ultimately wants us to do. But sometimes a little bit of back and forth, a little bit of heat uh, can be more fruitful on what it does on a pop level, on like the cultural level. Um, yeah, I think, oh, excuse me. I, um, yeah, in hindsight, I don't know. I don't know. If, we'll see. Okay. I think him and I just both really wanted to protect the, um, the cordialness of the debate. You guys did that for sure. Probably. Is that working now? How's everybody doing? You're not supposed to talk to me or clap. You didn't listen to the instructions. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank everybody for showing up and a huge thank you to Crossman Church for putting this together. Uh, John in particular, I'm going to actually vamp until they start the clock so I don't cheat and get extra time because it's at zero. And that, and that, like that, that's prop. Like I, I got to give him props there. Like he's, yeah. he's not trying to take an advantage. He's being friendly. You he, like, he's really good at crowd interaction. He's a very good public speaker. You can tell he's seasoned in doing this. Like, yeah, I give props for props dude. The, the man knows yeah. how to do this job. Like, yeah, a hundred percent. Yep. Um, but I, I like the fact that pastor John started with a prayer because it allows me to see whose head doesn't bow and whose eyes remain open. So I know he's on my side. Uh, I don't know why I took my glasses off. I'm not gonna be able to read anything. Okay, you, you just yell at me from the back. So, uh, let me see where my notes are. All right. If you guys enjoy this conversation, and I heard that the, for those watching on the stream, I heard the stream went down briefly for part of Than's presentation. So uh, you, may, you may have like a four or five minute thing to make up somewhere else. Hopefully it stays on for my part because that'll give me an advantage. Uh, not much of one, but a little bit. Uh, we're debating the topic of whether or not the resurrection of Jesus is probably an actual historical event. And my position is that it's probably not. This is unusual right because there, I'm often accused of just being the guy who shows up to talk about the burden of proof and say, oh, I don't believe that. I'm not convinced, not convinced, not convinced. It really irritates everybody who interacts with me. But that's too bad because that's the way skepticism works and that's the way the burden of proof works. In this case, we specifically said it so that we can talk about probabilities. And I'm not really going to require you to look at formulas or math, but we are going to talk about a sort of intuitive discernment, I guess, of the probabilities of certain... Yeah, see, I don't, I don't think he took on a burden of proof there. Oh, really? No, I, I think he said the opposite. I think he said, too bad. This is kind of how skepticism works. Right? I don't have to take on it a burden of proof. Like maybe I'm misreading his intention, but yeah, that, I'm not sure. That's what it seems like to me. And like, cause I remember I sit, I was, I was sitting with the wife and I remember saying, of course that's what he's going to say. Yeah. He's, but he specifically said that he's going to argue that it probably did not happen. Y yeah. Well, hold on. Let's go back a, a couple seconds. Um, okay. Advantage. Uh, not much of one, but a little bit. Uh, we're debating the topic of whether or not the resurrection of Jesus is probably an actual historical event. And my position is that it's probably not. This is unusual because I'm often accused of just being the guy who shows up to talk about the burden of proof and say, oh, I don't believe that. I'm not convinced, not convinced, not convinced. It really irritates everybody who interacts with me. pause there. Yeah. Right. He said it, it's unusual because I'm usually this guy. Right. So like that qualification. But but let's continue because like just like Alex 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 says in the the chat is it Alexis or Lex Alex, I, I I'm sorry if I'm Alexis. You, I, you've been here for a while and I don't even know how to say your name. This is how awful I am as a host. Um, but he he says he, he's going off intuition here, which means he's not doing a burden of proof. It's too bad because that's the way skepticism works and that's the way the burden of proof works. In this case, we specifically said it so that we could talk about probabilities. And I'm not really going to require you to look at formulas or math, but we are going to talk about a sort of intuitive discernment i guess of the probabilities of certain claims right so he, he's he's willing to Al alex alex alexis <laughs> with the uh uh fair, fair enough uh, maybe so yeah think, maybe i don't think he's taking on a burden of proof okay we'll we'll have to matt actually hates this phrase so if you're watching this matt i'm sorry we'll have to agree to disagree there <laughs> that, that's fine <laughs> maybe he is but if he is it's a low like a low burden of proof like he's not, he's not trying to bring anything to the table. You know what I mean? He's just yeah, kind of yeah. trying to show us intuitively why this is wrong. Would you disagree with that? Uh, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Okay. We'll, we'll keep we'll going. Just move on. So if we have claims from history, how do we go about confirming whether or not those claims are likely, whether or not they probably occurred? Uh, because we don't have time machines as far as I know, the investigation process, ideally, 
looks for sources that are uh, near the events, temporarily speaking, not, not decades or so later, uh, that are primary sources, hopefully people involved or eyewitnesses when possible, reliable, uh, ooh, reliable contemporary historians, people who were around at the same time and are good reporters of those things, reports from all sides of an event. If there's a war and only one side tells a story, we shouldn't be as confident that their story is correct as if the other side is telling similar stories. And then we get down to independent investigations and whether or not those sources are documented. Is that time right? That's wonderful. Am I getting a whole? It's close enough. Bam's like, he's getting eight minutes more than me. And then the, probably the lowest end are dubious contemporaries or dubious people who weren't even contemporaries. As we go through and look at the sorts of claims and the sort of people who are making those claims and the evidence, we also need to consider the nature of the claim. A mundane claim like Steve built a boat, no big deal. We have plenty of evidence that boats exist and people build boats. A slightly more extraordinary claim uh, that Steve built a huge boat for a massive storm. And then the incredibly extraordinary claim that some might consider outlandish or absurd, Noah built a boat that he was able to hold representatives of all the species on earth in order to survive a global flood. The type of evidence that we might need for those claims is gonna be a little bit different because the claim about a boat is consistent with mountains of evidence that we already have and the claims about a global flood is inconsistent with the evidence that we already have. When we consider the nature- So here, here's an issue I have because what he usually, Matt is notorious for saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The, the issue is that he kind of debunked what he claimed right there because he says we already have mountains of evidence to know that people have normal boats, right? So when somebody builds a bigger boat, well, we require more evidence. What, what he's actually saying is that you need the same amount of evidence for a bigger boat as you do for the smaller boat. It's just that we already live in a world that we have that evidence. So it, we're more likely to believe it because we've already seen the case has been proven. And I just, I disagree with the statement that he says all the time, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence because we don't, we don't know, really know how to define an extraordinary claim. We don't know how to define extraordinary evidence. So we just have claims and evidence and we have claims that don't have evidence and we have claims that do have evidence. We know people have dogs in their households because we've seen it happen. There's a lot of evidence of people having dogs. So if someone makes that claim, we already have an abundance of evidence that that's a true statement. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I actually, um, uh, there, there'll be a video on, on my YouTube channel coming out actually talking about that slogan, extraordinary claims that require extraordinary evidence. And I'll be doing a, a very thorough breakdown of what the skeptic could possibly be meaning when they say it mm. in the most charitable way and why at the end of the day, it's like, it's just a slogan and actually doesn't mean anything else other than the slogan. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm guessing um, you want to break that down at the moment. Yeah, it'll take too long. Yeah. Nature of the claim, it's very if you look at a global flood, that's something that might actually leave verifiable empirical evidence that we can go out and discover. Turns out, not so much. When you look at a claim like... Lots of verifiable empirical, empirical evidence for a localized flood, if you hold to that theory, I'm just saying. Was somebody resurrected? Is that the sort of claim that might leave independently verifiable empirical evidence? Probably not, but that won't prevent people from making the claim that they have some empirical evidence for it. If we look at a claim like, is there evolutionarily speaking a common ancestry between humans and great apes? That's something that could leave independently verifiable empirical evidence like the fusing of chromosome two, which kind of confirms along with a bulk of other evidence, common ancestry that we share with our other great apes. What about a claim like George Washington couldn't tell a lie and definitely chopped down that cherry tree? The nature of that claim is a little different as well. It's difficult to investigate. You would want to check the sources that I listed before, but it's also the type of story that is fanciful and unlikely to be true. This Sunday is an incredibly important day for me because it's my birthday. <laughs> I know for the rest of you, it's something to do with Jesus, but that day keeps moving around, but uh, there's no reason for you to care about my birthday, but uh, I'll be 55. I was born in March of 1969, thank you. Uh, stop talking to me. <laughs> in July of 1969, we landed on the moon. There are people today who don't think that happened. There are people today who, no matter what evidence you put in front of them, will deny that that- I gotta say, I like this mat way more than the other mats I've seen. Like I know say Matt, but like throughout the debates, like this this guy, like I like him a lot. He seems super nice, super chill, fun, respectful to uh the Christian. And like I had an interaction with Matt on Twitter once. And like if I'm gonna gauge it based off of those two things, like the Matt I had the interaction with on Twitter, F that guy. He was an, he was a jerk. This Matt I, I wish it was he was like this all the time. And maybe he is. Maybe it's just the public persona. But I, I got to give him. Yeah, I, I have no clue. I can only kind of judge based off what I've seen on the Internet and my own personal experiences with him. Um, and I, I went into meeting him 
with the decision that I'm going to pull away all this internet drama and just give it like have it well have a fresh slate and all this other stuff um because i don't want what i didn't want is for all that stuff to like poison my mind with preconceived notions of what he's going to be like um, kind of like he did i forget the guy's name uh, the guy who runs the crucible we did a debate with him they, they kind of started off heated and he ended up walking out did you watch that I didn't watch it, but I've heard about it. But like Matt, Matt's at least with my experience, Matt's a really cool guy. Um, super chill, and we had really good conversations. So now, um, some people are saying stuff like, "Oh, well, fans just really nice, and he pulled that si- pulled that out of him, or something like that." I don't know. I think Matt might just actually be a nice guy, and people annoy and then there's just people that are annoying once you do this for like 30 40 years <laughs> it's just it gets tiring and i can i can actually relate to i haven't done it 34 years but i've been doing like the tiktok lives now for three years and uh bro i am not as chill as i was when i did it the first yeah time. exactly people, yeah people used to comment all the time like i can't believe how calm and relaxed you are like you're so chill and you're so and i'm like well yeah they're just people search and then i'll like after three years i'm like i've literally hit my own head with the microphone These people won't stop yeah i like, get it. it like it's just a certain point they get to you so if he's been doing it 30 years and i've heard some of the things that people say to him like maybe i got to give a little grace to the guy because yeah yeah some christians say some wild things so anyways the, the whole some of this this was a good mat. i like this man yeah that happened francis or well, the uh, stanley cooper got together with some people in a studio and filmed it and it's all just a fiction if you believe that the rest of this debate's not going to go well for you um the, it's probably we landed on the moon almost certainly we landed on the moon i'm a skeptic there's a difference between skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism isn't just saying, nope, I don't believe it. Nope, I don't believe it. It's about trying to define what should convince us and making sure we have good standards of evidence. In May of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted in one of the, well, the deadliest and economically destructive uh, volcanic eruptions in the history of the, of the modern United States, in any case. 57 people died, 200 homes were destroyed, 47 bridges were destroyed, 15 miles of railway were destroyed, 185 miles of highway were destroyed. There's a big crevice there where the mountain used to be. I haven't heard any conspiracy theories suggesting that didn't happen. I won't say it absolutely happened, even though I watched it, but it pretty certainly happened. The interesting thing, though, is that I have a cousin who showed up just a week later with a little vial of volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens. How does he know that's from Mount St. Helens and not from somebody who just picked some stuff up or burnt some firewood in the backyard and stuffed it in there? He didn't bother to investigate, and neither would you, probably. Neither would I, because it doesn't matter if what's in the vial is actually something relevant to Mount St. Helens. It's just a cool thing, and it reminds you of it, and that's good enough. While I'm an advocate for knowing as many true things and as few false things as possible, uh, Well, I'm okay with not knowing absolutely everything. It'd be nice, but I recognize that it's an impractical thing. What about other claims? I I watched a a quick short video from my friend Seth today, although it's from years ago, and he was talking about a cancer survivors forum online where they made a post saying, after prayer and a year and a half of chemotherapy, I'm now 100% cancer free. Now for a lot of people in this room, you're like, yes, praise the Lord. For the other people in this room, the ones that didn't bow their heads, why on earth did we mention prayer? If I'd have said, after rubbing my lucky rabbit's foot for a while and chemotherapy for a year and a half, I'm now cancer free, People would look at me like I had three heads because we don't consider generally lucky rabbit's feet to have anything to do with cancer recovery. Yet we do, some of us, tend to think that there's a God who's going to intervene and potentially cure cancers. And see, this is the kind of thing that Matt does all the time is like he speaks on things that like are intuitive. Like people have this natural feeling of like, of course, you know, rabbit's feet are, are not, aren't actually lucky and it's stupid to believe in that. Um, so we have that intuitive feeling that that's ridiculous. And then he puts a correlation to that to like this belief in God. But the problem with that is it doesn't address the mountains of evidence that we have for God. It doesn't address the, you know, the testimonies, the gospels. Um, we don't have any testimonies for a lucky rabbit's foot. We don't have any gospels for a rabbit's foot. We don't have any data on that. So th- this is one of the reasons that I, I like I, I dislike his debating style because very much so, and especially in this opening statement from what I've seen so far, it's an intuition pump. It just, just relies on what people intuitively feel and think on the surface level and doesn't actually do what a lot of uh, – what, what do the atheists always claim Christians never do? We don't critically think. It doesn't do th- th- those steps. Well, okay – if 2.5 billion people in the world believe in God more, because if we're going to include uh, Muslims and, and 80% of the world believes in a God, well, there's something to that. 
right? But we don't have 80% of the world believing in lucky rabbit's feet. So uh, I don't know. Do you want, do you want to add to that? Um, no, like I get it. Like this, this is the type of thing that really plays to the quote unquote common sense of somebody, right? It's like, well, yeah, it's common sense that the rabbit's foot's not doing anything. And then, like you said, there's the parallel being drawn to God. Um, and to the analytic philosopher, there's obviously going to be a, a, a very big relevant. There's a, a number of really big relevant differences to a rabbit's foot compared to a theistic explanation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I don't know what else to add to that. Yeah, fair enough. Uh... A little selective about who he does or doesn't care. For any of those claims, we may never know the answer. We may never reach a conclusion about how likely or probable something is, especially if we're trying to tie a cause to an event. But what we can do is we can begin analyzing the sources. If there isn't empirical evidence of a resurrection of Jesus, and I'm unaware of any, then the next thing is to go to the source. And the primary source is the Bible. Now, I understand before people get all up in arms, the Bible is 66 books by a bunch of, your, your Bible, the Protestant Bible, is 66 books by a bunch of different authors. Uh, and so it would be a problem for me to fault the author of Matthew for the, what the author of Kings wrote and vice versa. But can we at least for today agree that the Bible, despite being a collection of books, is a package deal that has been put together specifically for a purpose and that the primary claim of most advocates of the Bible is that if there's a cohesive narrative there, it's all the word of God or inspired by God, etc. So I also have an issue with that because there's a lot of presupposition there. Right. Like he, he brings the objection that people would have, but then he says, well, this is your guys's claim. This is your guys's dogma. And I don't think he should argue his perspective and his point from the opponent's dogma. Do you know? What yeah. I mean? Well, the other in the other side of the coin, there is he actually doesn't know my like your stance. Yeah. And so like this is this is the part of the debates that I'm not really sure what is good and bad, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. because. If I, in, at least by my, by my lights, you want to debate as if you're talk as if you're trying to take down your debate opponent's views, um, and it seems like Matt is trying to play off of the audience and what their understanding of Christian theology might be, based off of or or just play off of what he thinks Christian theology is. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, like, um, I, I don't know. Do you hold a univocality? I hold to the inspiration of Scripture. Right, but, but you, like, wouldn't, you wouldn't say that uh, the author of King speaks in the same voice as the Gospel of John. Yeah, absolutely not. Right, and so like what he's presupposing there is, again, a singular like voice, this univocality, that's this belief. So, And this is the part that bugs me is because he, he jumps all throughout Scripture and says, like he, he goes, and he'll get into this, he goes into, I think it was Elijah or Elijah, and he, and he starts doing the comparison there, and he's like, well, the data here is small. So and he Yeah, I, I wish he would have... I wish he would have brought that up during the cross exam because um, it's a really interesting point, right? Like as a Christian, it, it at least at first glance, it seems like you're in a dilemma, right? Um, either you're going to accept this very limited, like the evidence for, for this event, like the Elijah account, right? is very limited. There's just one account and that's it. Mm -hmm. And if you accept that that's historical, well, you kind of look like your evidential bar is really low, right? Um, but if you say no, I don't think it, it's true. Then you look really bad because you're a Christian. You think something in the some things in the Bible that doesn't didn't happen, right? Right. Um, but the but the problem with that is you can take something like you can say there's enough evidence to Jesus Christ's resurrection, and you can yeah, say that's what I was going to get to. Yeah. Right. And I was going to say, and that, that's when I, that's why if he would have brought it up in the cross exam, I'd be like, well, yeah, I might inductively support something like the Elijah account, though, through the resurrection of, of scripture, I mean, through the resurrection of Jesus, um, a, a case for the inspiration of scripture and the reliability of the Bible as a whole. Like those three things together get me to a pretty high prior that a prior probability that something that's claimed in the Bible is probably, if we, exegete the text and it's like a, it's meant to be read as a historical thing right it jacks up the prior quite a bit if yeah. all those three other things are in the background yeah so for for stupid speak for the chat basically he's saying if we can confirm that jesus resurrected it's not far off that elijah re resurrected 
right? Like, yeah. like if we can confirm one resurrection, like we could say, yes, Jesus resurrected. And, and it's more likely than when we look at other, re- other re- resurrections, like we were talking about earlier about evidence. Well, we now have evidence of resurrection. So we can say, well, yeah, this is likely to happen, right? Because we see that he's involved in this uh, narrative of uh, Israel. And we can see that there are resurrections in this narrative of Israel. So it's not unlikely that Elijah would resurrect or the boy that he resurrected would resurrect, right? Uh, this control of death in general. Yeah. So we'll just take it as one thing for now. It was curated with a bias, but that bias doesn't mean that it's false. I make sure because sometimes when I use a word, people get up in arms. You're claiming it's biased. Hey, I got a bias towards truth and reality. It's, it's okay. But what other claims does that book or that collection of books make? What claims do we have to consider when we consider the entirety of that for its reliability? Uh, a flood, a global flood, a local flood. And see, th- this is ridiculous. This, w- this was awful to do because he- he's, he's not focusing on the resurrection of Jesus. He's focusing on the reliability of the Bible in its whole. And that wasn't even your argument. Your argument was for the reliability of the Gospels. And he's saying, look mm-hmm. at all these other ridiculous claims in the Bible. So why should we hold to this ridiculous, ridiculous claim? We're not necessarily sure. I don't know what your church actually teaches because there's competing views on it. An ark where all the species were uh, located. Somebody survived in a big fish for three days. There were people living to be 500 to 969 years old. The Nile River Uh, turned into blood. I didn't catch that Jonah reference. That would have been a really good time for me to have been like, hey, Matt, in my rebuttal, just been like, hey, Matt, you should watch my video, my Jonah video on YouTube. (laughs) Yeah, well, because you don't hold to Jonah actually being in the belly of a fish. I don't know. I think he, I just think he drowned in water. It, like if you take the Jonah account to be historical, I just think he drowned in the water. And then was resurrected. Yeah. Yeah. Moses' wife circumcised their kid and threw the foreskin at God to keep him from killing Moses. There's talking donkey, a talking serpent. Um, David collects a hundred foreskins so that he can buy a bride. The sun stands still in the sky for an. Ent- now that's that's re- like you could believe that even if you don't believe in God. The David the, the and the foreskin, foreskin thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Like you just threw that out to just be like, look how look how trash this Bible is. Like, like that's not like unreasonable to believe. If you, if I told you a king a thousand years ago cut off, I'm even laughing. Horses, you, you can look in this, can look in the back. I'm laughing, <laughs> <laughs> bro. I I gotta know though. Did he make a coat with it or what? Entire day, <laughs> kind of conflicts with at least what we know about physics. And note that I'm not saying these didn't happen. I'm not saying that you can't violate physics. I'm not saying miracles are impossible. I'm saying before I can believe they are possible, we need to see good evidence for those things. So if we look at these and we're trying to figure out what's the likelihood that these events happened, what's the probability that these events happened, it seems some people would like to say they're all impossible. I don't know how you conclude to that. I don't know how potentially unfalsifiable things can be labeled as impossible. There's a difference between a logical possibility, which everything's logically possible to rule it out with a defeater, and then there's what's an empirical possibility, and I'm an advocate that empirical possibilities need to be demonstrated, and so do empirical impossibilities. But the problem with that is he says that empirical impossibilities need to be demonstrated. But the problem is if it's demonstrated, then by definition it's empirical. So he's given like a self-defeater claim. Like, correct me if I'm wrong. You're the smart one here. So, but like... He, he's made this statement that like you ha- you should be able to demonstrate it, right? Like if, if it can't be demonstrated, you should be able to demonstrate it. That's basically what he said. Yeah. I, so there's a, it's hard to, to really understand what he's getting at here. And so like, again, if, he, if Matt's watching this, um, do you think Matt's going to watch my channel, bro? Maybe he will. I don't know. Hi, Matt. Um, Long time fan. That's actually true. I've been watching you since I became a Christian. Used to go to church every Sunday, and then after I went to church, I watched your show. That, that, that was my ritual. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so, like, it sounds like he's saying it has to be, like, shown to be fit to, like, physically exist or, like, something like that, right? Um. And if that's what, you, what he means, right, Some there's some there's some issues – um but the issues aren't contradictory unless you want to hold to some issues so like for for instance black holes might be a counterexample to this um prior to 2 years ago we had no physical evidence of black holes mm. right we just had in we had indirect evidence through the laws of nature and observations in the world and in the universe right and because of the laws of nature, we could predict that black holes existed. 
And then we had other evidence of their existence, like some of the some of the ways planets rotate and stuff like that. Um, for like that made that were expected on a hypothesis that a black hole might be in like this location in space, right? But the problem is we never demonstrated, at least as I I'm understanding Matt saying this here, we've never demonstrated that they existed up until we actually observed them directly. If that makes sense. It does, but I, I don't. <sighs> so then the question's like, were the scientists that posited black holes as an explanation for all these things just engaging in bad methodology? Well, the thing is, I, I would say that because you say we don't have any like actual demonstrable evidence till a couple of years ago. But I'd say like five years ago, 10 years ago, like I don't think he would say it's unreasonable to say a black hole exists. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so he might, he might, but the problem standard. is he might, the issue is with that, he might bite the bullet and stay consistent. Right. And say that he's not convinced of black holes. Well, he, he is now. Right. Yeah. Cause but back there's then. pictures, right. Yeah. The problem is like that, that's a testimony, right. It, pretty much because that picture could have been doctored. Um, so there's a, there's, there's one, a counter example. Another counter example to this that I think is a little more fatal is origin of life. Um, cause to date we haven't been able to replicate origin of life, right? We, we have the, like we in the labs, we have the scientific building blocks, the amino acids to like to replicate life. Yeah. But does he hold to the promo primordial soup? I, I don't know what he holds to, right? But, but you don't even have to do that because we have very strong evidence that at one point on earth, there was no life and then there was life, Right. Um, but the problem is we haven't demonstrated yet empirical possibility that life can come from non-life. Now, this isn't like an anti-evolutionist argument or anything like that, right? It's just kind of like what the facts are. Um, we have models of how that could have happened, but we haven't demonstrated any of those models yet. Yeah, but him, him as a skeptic would just say, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Right, but I don't, we don't need to know what happened. That's, that's, that's why this counterexample seems a little finicky here. Because... My main point is we have all we haven't demonstrated that it's possible for life to come from non-life. Whatever mo whatever whatever model it is, that doesn't matter. The fact is that the evidence points to that happening. But if you but if you haven't demonstrated empirical possibility for it to happen, that leaves you with another option, which is that life was always around. But then that's a different but then that's a horn a dilemma that you're stuck with then is the fact that this other horn has very little, little evidence for it and a lot of evidence against it because we have tons of evidence that life was not always around, right? Hmm. Do you get the dilemma there? Yeah, but the, I just feel like, like I'm trying to see it from Matt's viewpoint. Is like he could say, well, maybe there always has been life on on some sort of like really small that we can't even see. Like he could, he could posit a whole bunch of theories and he has to say, I don't have to hold any of them, right? I could just say, I don't know. But I have right. no reason to believe that. But, I, like but I'm some... exhausting the theories to two pools. Life originated or life was always here. So like I'm saying, gonna... he, could, he could say life was always here. Like we could say that there's some sort of life that goes down to like this very small thing. Right. And then, the issue, yeah, and then the issue, that, then the, the issue there is there's just so, too, so much evidence against that, that the probability of his theory being true is extremely low. Right. So then if he says, okay, it, it came from non-life, but we haven't figured out a way to do that yet. Oh, well then, so then, then, so then the criteria of a demonstrating empirical possibility is not a true criterion. Right. So, but, but again, why can't he just posit that? I don't know. Why like, can't he posit? Like, I don't he, know. Like he could just say, he could just say, looking back at all of this, like saying, Okay, it seems that we have a, a existence where there was no life and then that there was life, right? How that happened, I don't know, right? Yeah. I'm not going to pause it so, anything. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say I don't know. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm broadening the scope here between the two options, right? The, whole, the, the question of how life originated mm -hmm. presupposes that life did originate. Right. Right. So – the, so it's, it's it's asking a different question. What happened is the 
did life originate or not originate? Or like, did life originate or was it always here? That's the what happened question. Sure. If you answer the question with life did originate, then you follow it up with how did life originate? And that's the question that he might say, I don't know, too. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right. But that question's not the one that's being used for the counter example, if that makes sense. Yeah, but I'm saying like that counter example, because we're, we're making an active claim here, right? We're, we're saying that this resurrection actually happened and he says it has to be demonstrated for him to believe that. He can, uh -huh. look, he can look back and say, life, there was no life and there was life. At some point it happened, but I'm not making any sort of claim, right? I'm just saying this is the data we have. There's no life, there's life, and I don't know anything else outside of that. I'm not actually asking anybody to believe anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, and then that, and at that point, you're just not doing science. Well, you're not reasoning about anything. That's all. Yeah. So, but the, I mean, like, it, it, here's the other here's the other problem. You, those are your logically exhaustive options. There's no possible other option. That's a true dichotomy. Either it happened or didn't happen. Right. Right. You can you can withhold judgment. That's fine. But that doesn't tell you about anything about what happened. Just so you know, I agree with you on all these things. I'm yeah, just yeah, trying yeah. to play devil's advocate. And I know, I know, I know you are, right? And at that point, then, so like, and so if the skeptic just wants to keep going, well, I just don't know what happened, right? Two things. One, I expect you to be consistent there, and I never want to hear you say what science tells us happened ever again, <laughs> right? But I mean, okay, now now I'm going to play from like John. Why can't they say that? Well, I know science says that, you know, we can send electricity because I've witnessed it and we can repeat it and it's all in front of me. But I can say I don't know when we're talking about the primordial soup. Right, exactly. And then two, the other thing too would just be like, look, um, you can withhold judgment all you want, right? The the, cons it, the the ability to hold to a, a methodology and a, an epistemology consistently doesn't tell you whether or not is whether or not that methodology and epistemology is what you ought to follow, mm. right? Yeah. So the, like, there's this follow up question, which is, why ought I accept these criterion and why ought I accept this methodology and all this other stuff? Okay. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I think so. So like it like so if the skeptic wants to just be like, no, I I demand empirical possibility, otherwise I'm not convinced, right? Then I can just my my question is gonna be sh sure, fine. That doesn't ad address my argument. And furthermore, why should I accept the criterion that you're putting up? Why should I accept the methodology you're putting up? Why like give me arguments for why I should accept this over the one I'm putting up? Fair enough. Uh, just quick sidetrack. I just noticed that that chair looks really comfy. And like your what? backdrop oh, kicks my backdrop's butt. Like, thank you. you the you chair, know. the chair is because I'm still recovering from surgeries. Right. I, I, I understand. But now I'm thinking I got to get me a big chair for my background. Uh, it's that, nice. That T jump style. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, because of the time, I just realized it's like one in the morning. I want to, I'm going to get through his statement and then we're going to yeah. go to the cross examination. We're going to skip the Q and a, cause I actually don't think there was a whole lot of fruit in the Q and a. So, cool. so rather than concluding that this is impossible or possible, I don't know, but does that sound like a credible source given what we know about reality with all of those outlandish stories? It doesn't to me, but that doesn't mean they're wrong. And some people would be like, well, that's the old Testament. Um, okay. Jesus performed a lot of miracles supposedly that I also am not convinced happened. I don't see compelling evidence for them. They are stories and some of them don't make much sense. Like when there's a whole bunch of people who are possessed by demons and Jesus drives the demons into a bunch of pigs that then run off a cliff and die. Why? In other areas of the Bible, when we cast out demons, they're just cast out. Why did we send a bunch of pigs to their death? And when those pigs die, do the demons die too? Or do the demons just get to go back to wherever they were before? It's, it seems to be an absurdly cruel thing to do. There's some difficulty in reconciling the various Easter accounts or the resurrection accounts. In the so just quick note, like that, all he's doing is, again, again this, all of this has been so far as an intuition pump. Right. It, it, like there could be a valid reason on why Jesus did that to point at it and say, well, that's weird to me. So therefore, we shouldn't believe in the resurrection is completely irrelevant. Right? Well, if I'm going to steel man it, right, like it might affect the prior probability. How? Um, you might say something like and I don't think this argument actually runs right. I'm just steel, steel manning. Um, 
I might say something like, look, um, you gave an argument for why God would become incarnate and he'd live a perfect moral life, yada, yada, yada. And you said Jesus is the only candidate. But that, that's not the subject. The subject is, did he resurrect? That's the subject. Well, hold on, because it because that can affect the prior probability. Okay. That's all I'm saying. Sure. If you play your cards right. I don't think that's what he's doing here, though. No, I, I don't think so either. Right. What, I, what I'm saying, I like I, I understand what you're trying to steal, man. But I don't think that's where his mind was going. I think I think what's happening is he's saying this is weird on the surface level. There doesn't seem to be a valid reason we kill a bunch of innocent pigs. So if that's strange and, and that's just kind of where it leaves, like, yeah, th this is very much what he does in his debates. He, he knows there's a skeptics out there that, that look at Christianity and you see it's nonsense. We can see this because they come into the chats and say, you believe in a talking snake and a talking donkey. Like he even brought that up himself. Right? Like that's a ridiculous thing to believe, but there's a pre, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Predisposition. No, um, the pre presupposition that these things can't happen. And that's the crux of what our argument actually is at the point is like, we're saying, yes, these things can happen. You're saying, no, they can't. And that's the debate. So you saying it's ridiculous to believe it is begging the question. You're assuming you're already correct. Yeah. The four Gospels. There are, if I can open my phone, there are disparities, maybe they're not a big deal, between where there, which women were at the tomb, were the guards at the tomb, what was the time of this, what was the reason for the visit, was the stone already rolled away, did an earthquake happen and roll the stone away while they were there, did they enter the tomb at all, did the disciples visit the tomb, did the disciples enter the tomb, what did the disciples see, uh, what did Jesus say to the women, what was the first appearance, or Jesus' first appearance to the disciples, there's slightly different versions of this, and what we're largely told, I'm not going to speak for them, that's a good argument. Like, like on, like, I know we have explanations for this, but like on the surface level, like that, that's a solid argument. Cause we'd say we, we see inconsistencies throughout the gospels. Uh, this would lower the probability that they're trustworthy. Um, yeah. I know, I know you could argue that they had actually raised the probability because this is what we expect to see. Yeah. It depends on what the inconsistencies are, but yeah. yeah. Is that that's to be expected. Like, we're going to describe an elephant and different people are going to describe it differently. So we're telling kind of the same story and that's fine. And it shows the human side of this. But if this is supposed to be the inspired word of an almighty God who is giving sound evidentiary warrant to believe what should be the most important event in the history of the world, that's pretty weak. The problem, the problem with this part of his argument is that let, let's, let's, uh, let's pretend that we, we were given gospels that were absolutely perfect and identical to each other. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's no discrepancies between the four. Uh, his argument would then would be, um, this is clearly obviously a copy. We can see that people were lying. They were con colluding with each other and copying each other because it's not how the human brain works. So like, it's very simple to take that argument and flip it, right? I, I can see many atheists arguing, hey, like the Quran being, th that's like the biggest argument from the Quran is that there's no discrepancies, which is not true. But there's no conscriptancies and has been changed for hundreds of years. Therefore, it's the word of God. That's the least convincing argument that I've ever heard for following a religion in my life. So even if we had that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I don't think it would change his perspective at all. Do you want to add to that? No. Okay. Just there are other resurrections through. in the Bible. What's that? I'm just, uh, I'm keeping, I'm going to keep my commentary to a minimum since you said that you, we got to move fast. I didn't know as much about this when I was growing up. Um, of course, Elijah's got the, the, the first one uh, where he resurrects the son of a widow. And then Elijah comes along because Elijah... But you tell me if I say something stupid. At least do that. I will, I will. Okay. He's spirited up to heaven in a whirlwind, uh, never dies, which is kind of weird. But Elisha comes along with double Elijah's power and is evidently granted it. So Elisha also raises the son, not of a widow this time, but of a woman who he uh, told her that she would have a child. She did. And then the child got sick and died and they sent for him and he came and raised that kid up. Uh, and, but we've got to give him double the power. So Elisha dies and hasn't done a second resurrection. So when the Moabites are invading, they happen to show up at, in the middle of a funeral, and in order to safeguard the body, they chuck the body into Elisha's tomb. And when that dead body touched Elisha's bones, it came back to life. Now, when I was a Christian, this is all the power of God, not Elijah. Prophets have no power. There's no power for Elijah to grant to Elisha. These passages are very confusing about where the source of power is, and it's why we end up selling bits and pieces of the saints and selling bits of the cross. Jesus then comes along and is compared to Elijah and Elisha, not by name, but they compared him to those prophets, uh, resurrects Jairus' daughter, a young man named in Luke, Lazarus, obviously, we all, you know, everybody heard about that one. Uh, and then Paul resurrects uh, Tabitha and, and potentially Eutychus. So there's, there's some 
potential problems with that. I just released a video about all these other resurrections. They're not relevant uh, to the details of Jesus' resurrection, but they are relevant to the reliability of the source. And some of these are... But the problem here, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, he's pulling from multiple sources. He's not pulling from a source. Right? Like he says, it's a problem with the source, but the thing is, we don't look at um, First Kings to look at Matthew, yeah. Mark, Luke, and John and say it's yeah. trustworthy. And, and that's, that's the ultimate issue with that argument there is that we, we could say that the entire Old, uh, Old Testament is untrustworthy. We don't have to. And then say that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the letters of Paul are trustworthy. And then we'd have yeah. to figure out what to do with that information once we did that. Yeah, I, this was kind of hard to track because I'm uh, arguments like this are hard to try to respond to because I'm like, I don't want to respond to an interpretation of the argument that he's not actually giving, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, the best way I can think of like the argument is kind of like that dilemma that I think is the best way to like put it together, which is like, hey, if you say yes, well, you look gullible. If you say no, well, you're a Christian. But then like you and I said, it's if you can inductively support it through the rest of these other things, then you're fine. Mm -hmm. Presented with nothing. That story about Elisha where they throw the body into his tomb and it comes in contact with bones and it comes back to life. That's the whole story. It's two verses. Now, hang on. These are remarkable events. These are the sort of things that you'd want to say, hey, here's some evidence. And I remember listening to this, too. Uh, he says these are remarkable events like, hey, let's provide some evidence. Um, He's also presupposing that back then that there was just as much skepticism and they didn't see miracles on a regular basis and they would provide evidence. Uh, so, so that's an issue, too. Like, it could very well be that in that time period, a miracle like this is as nonchalant as saying, hey, he resurrected from the dead. And people are like, whoa, that's wild. And it was just how they <laughs> lived. Yeah, it could be. Um... I don't think that's the case. I'm just saying. No, I know. I'm... I don't think people in the ancient world were as gullible as people make them out to be. I would They're say gullible. I, I would just say like. Part no, of no, I'm not saying I'm not saying you are. I'm not. I'm not saying you are. I'm saying typically like modern day skeptics will treat the ancient ancients like they're super gullible, and I don't think they were that gullible. They, um, they built like not, the pyramids, bro. Like, well, they're, no, they're that was the aliens. People. That was the aliens. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you though. Like, we we can't we can't just assume that people back then were stupid. They they had different types of knowledge, but it's not that they lacked intelligence by any means. Yeah, exactly. Nope, they're tossed around as if they're just so stories. So is it probable? What's the likelihood of miracles? I don't know. What's the likelihood of a resurrection? I don't know. But there's a side question that's kind of important, which is: Is it even possible? Because as we'll get into a little bit during the rebuttal and addressing things, doing a Bayesian analysis requires you to have good priors. What if it's not possible? What if your assessment of your best guess and then revising it with data, which I'll get into a little later, gives you a probability percentage that's high. Hyper, that's not funny. Or low, but still wrong. What do you do then? For the resurrection of Jesus, we have no empirical evidence that I'm aware of. We have no confirmed primary sources, although, there are sources that are claimed to be primary sources, eyewitnesses and accounts from those people about other eyewitnesses, but that at least be secondary. We have no way of investigating the claim. There are no contemporary historians accounts of the resurrection. The closest that we have there is Josephus with a disputed passage that just states it as a thing that happened, but doesn't present any sources or verification or evidence uh, to go along that way. There are no accounts from all sides like, yep, this Jesus guy rose, but we really don't like him. Okay, that's ridiculous. Well, that's not true though, right? Like the, the, the Talmud, I think talks about Jesus, talks about him. They didn't like him, uh, that he was a miracle worker, things like that. I don't know if it talks about the, I don't think it talks about him raising from the dead, but it, it talks about the fact that he performed sorcery. Yeah. So, and, and they didn't like it. They, they didn't agree with it. So like, I don't, I don't think anybody, There's a lot of, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, keep going. I, I was just gonna say, I don't think anybody in the early or, or during Jesus's time period or after Jesus's time period would say that he wasn't a miracle worker and not a healer. Like even even the contemporary sources or the en or enemy sources would say would agree with that. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. 
Yeah, I mean, so as I'm like really re-listening to this, there's also just a bunch of points that I wish I would like hit on the rebuttal. Um, like he brings up that we just don't have like non-Christian sources. Um, and we kind of hit on it in a cross exam, right? But like the whole point of my opening statement was we don't need them. We have a real, we have a reliable New Testament, hmm. and we don't go based off of the data we wish we had. We go off the data that we do have, right? Like you don't go, you don't go testing for a scientific theory and be like, you know, I just don't know, man. I wish I had more data, so I'm going to withhold judgment. I know it's super strong, but I want more data. Well, you know what I'm saying? And, and also the fact that it's like we don't have other sources that are not Christian. The problem is anybody who would be convinced that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead by default would probably become a Christian. Like, right. I don't I don't see any, that... any non-Christian source arguing saying that the resurrection happened would be a Christian source. Yeah. And, and we actually see that because we see that with Paul because he wasn't a Christian. Then he was convinced and he became a Christian. And so he, he'd be that other source. You all right with your neck, by the way? Keep... Yeah, yeah. I just got tight back and neck and everything so i just keep cracking it and then we see with james now james wouldn't be an enemy right but he was a non-believer and then he was convinced so yeah i think that's like we should see other people talking about it well if we did they would be a christian i don't don't see anybody again being convinced of not becoming a christian Ridiculous. That's probably not going to happen but you still don't have those sorts of claims you have no independent investigations and no way to dig in on it what you have are dubious sources the bottom of the barrel of the list that I made at the beginning. Because the Bible is propaganda. Propaganda isn't necessarily a bad thing. Apologists and evangelists are sharing what they believe to be true. The Bible is propaganda. It is selected writings that go towards a particular goal, which is to convince people of the things that the authors believed. Okay, well then provide some writings that go against it. That's another issue. It's like, it's not like, it's not like we're pushing the other writings into the, like, people on TikTok all the time. Did you know that the Vatican was hiding this? And, and it's like, no, it's out there. Yeah, like, we're not I hiding just, it. There's a lot of these things I just didn't know how to respond to. Well, like, in, like, like let's be real. Were you nervous? Like, this um, is your first public oh, debate. Oh, gosh, that's yeah, okay. yeah, 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 dude. I was, I was nervous. There, And the other thing going on in the back of my head was like, I didn't know how to respond to his opening while trying to protect the, like, friendship that we were, like, the friendliness, right? Because like I could, you could easily just go up there and pull like the William Lane Craig and be like, hey, "I gave my opening statement, step by step by step, premise, premise, premise." Um, I told you guys how to. Matt has to interact with it. Um, he brought up all these points. It doesn't interact with it. Like it, I could have done that, right? Um, I can't. Well, like I don't know how I feel about this because like I, I understand where you're coming from. And I think it's the good thing to do, but at the same note, like he didn't. He, he didn't interact with the subject at hand. And again, intuition pumped the whole thing. And this is what happens with Christianity all the time is that we have people who come in and they're like, this is ridiculous to believe because X, Y, and Z. And then we're like, well, this is why it's not. They're like, no, you're, you're stupid. And they kind of just leave it at that. And that's a little bit of what Matt Dillahunty is doing, but in a very respectful, intelligent, cordial way and, you know, very articulate but that, that's all he's providing. He's saying, look at all these things that are in Scripture. It's ridiculous to believe that. So if I wouldn't believe that, then I'm not going to believe the resurrection, which is irrelevant. It's, it's not even close to the topic or what you presented at all. Yeah, I mean, excuse me. In his defense, this is an, his, his opening. So yeah, it, I is, don't it is the opening. I don't expect him to, be, to rebuke it, but I expect him to at least talk about the resurrection yeah so we'll see what happens i f- i forget what is re- the re- what the rest of his opening and what even his rebuttal even said <laughs> um all right again you tell me if you gotta go i'm good bro okay well i'm just saying you look tired so i, I don't feel i like- am i am but i'm gonna be able to sleep like a baby when we're done with this okay its style isn't so much historical as fanciful on t- on occasion and again that doesn't mean it didn't happen but I just got in the chat. I'll never buy that you're an atheist in the TikTok chat. Somebody says that. It's it's always the one to happen. I I you, you caught me. I've been I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm just pretending to be an atheist because I think it's a more convincing argument to to make you guys pay tithes to me. I get mean, I get that all the time too. Yeah, it's stupid. How many confirmed resurrections do we have? I'm not aware of a single confirmed resurrection of any sort of where someone has died, been entombed, and rose again. 
but it wouldn't surprise me that something like that happened somewhere. There's a reason why people put bells on graves once upon a time just in case you got buried alive, but the presumption there was that you got buried alive, that somebody wrongfully determined you're dead. So in order to claim that there's been a resurrection, you need to have, first of all, some confirmation that they were in fact dead. And if the entirety of the evidence of their death and resurrection is in a propaganda story from a biased source, whether it's true or not, that's a bit of a problem. Disagree with the biased source. If you read the Bible, it anticipates the objections and poisons the well. It misrepresents good evidential standards by actually suggesting that doubt isn't good. Doubting Thomas, when he's told by the others that they've seen Jesus, says, I'm not going to believe it till I see it, and I'm able to put my hands, put my fingers through the holes in his hands and stuff like that. Jesus shows up to Thomas. Thomas puts his fingers through there, and Jesus basically says, you know, you've seen and now you believe, but blessed are those who believe having not seen. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to desperately try not to necessarily offend everybody who believes this, but that is really bad epistemology. That is the epistemology that allows you to be conned. And by doing it preemptively, saying you don't need to see this, blessed are you who believe not this having is seen. This something I wish I is... would have thought about doing in a rebuttal too. Because I don't think Jesus is making an epistemic claim here. Right? Like, he's like, in other words, he's not saying, he's not saying, hey, ble like when he's saying blessed are you who believe and have not seen, he's not saying like you have some virtue in you that's better than the people that need evidence, mm. right? He's just saying like, dude, you're blessed because you get to believe. Like, it, it's like a, it's a blessing that you get to believe it. If you get the distinction I'm trying to make here. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah uh, I can see that now, but I, I, I would never put that together unless someone explained it to me that way. So like, I can understand where he's coming from. And honestly, I oh, yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's making, um, I actually think he, this part is like a good point that he's making. It's like, d don't do that. Like, like, don't just believe things because, and I agree with him. Don't just believe things because. Setting you up to believe in the absence of evidence. So God, rather than pre presenting the best possible evidence, is presenting the weakest evidence, accounts that we can't confirm from sources that we can't confirm. We can suspect, we can talk about the likelihood, and we can talk about how honest they probably were, but you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. And you can be misrepresented and have your words twisted after the fact. Five minutes. Thank you. The Bible also gives people the suggestion that there is empirical evidence. What's the number one thing I've heard from Christians over the past 20 years? Empty tomb, empty tomb, explain the empty tomb. Explain. You want me to explain a hole in the ground? A hole in the ground that you can't confirm exists or ever contained a Jesus, let alone that the absence of a Jesus is somehow confirmation of a miraculous resurrection? There's no explanation needed for an empty tomb. At the end of... Well, no, but you, you have to explain why people believe the tomb was empty, right? That, that, that's something, that's the question people are asking. We're not saying prove I that mean, there isn't actually you, an empty hole. You also just do have to explain why the tomb is empty. Like, not just the, type, the fact that they believed it, right? Because the, the fact that they believed it is best explained by the fact that it was empty. Yeah. And then you have to explain why it was empty. Yeah, but what he's saying is that we can't even confirm, like, for all we know, somebody just wrote that and we can't confirm that. Oh, yeah. And then I, yeah. yeah. And then I gave a case for the New Testament reliability. If he would have pressed it in the, um, in the discussion area, uh, I would have actually brought up like a, an abductive argument for why the, ch the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is more than likely the authentic burial place of Jesus. We should talk about that at another point, too, man. We should just yeah. do a live once a month where you just tell me things. <laughs> <laughs> This would be great. I would love it. I'm not. I'm going to stop reading. I'm just going to listen to you. It was great. Fair enough. I hate reading, to be honest. The Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. Jesus ends with the same parable. I would have you raise your hand, ask if you knew what it was, but you guys aren't supposed to applaud or interact, so I won't. It's basically a warning about the fool builds his house on sand and the wise man builds his house on the rock. I'd ask you what the verse before that says, or the verse before that. I would imagine most of the Christians listening to this, like me, when I was a believer, I imagine all of you have read the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, probably many times, probably heard sermons on it many times. Do you remember it word for word? This, this argument in English? Really, in Greek? really drove me yeah. deep too. Like this one like kicked me in the nuts when I heard it because he, he's taking a modern day understanding and applying it to 2,000 years ago, right? 
like we have documentations of like somebody marrying or marrying somebody remembering an entire library using this sp- uh, specific technique. I forget what the technique was called. Um, he, he talks about it in that book, uh, the Jesus myth. So, you know, you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Uh, so we have people memorizing entire library. We have uh, legend keepers that walked around and recited these things off memory. Like we're talking about a world that doesn't have cell phones that no people can't, not everybody can read or write. Not everybody's got uh, papyrus, not like they can't document like we document. So the way that they had to do it is through memory. And we know people can have good memories because they memorize entire songs. They remember mem- memorize entire um speeches if you want to see somebody have a good memory go watch one of the rap battles that people yeah. have like they they'll do entire albums of content from their memory and and they do it like how they do with the the creeds right they do it through cadences this is like what we see yeah. in first corinthians 15 so to, to say that oh you and can't remember in my, in my rebuttal Sorry, too go ahead. no and i address it in my rebuttal too oh, did you i i forgot yeah. that yeah i cited i cited multiple studies on why memory is actually a lot more reliable than people think yeah i didn't like that one and sorry i stole your thunder then no no you're good my bad i'm so sorry you were paying attention to me you don't remember that part of my rebuttal wow i probably i was definitely paying attention man but i got the memory of a goldfish i'm just giving you I, I i would not be one of the people trusted to uh to keep those legends bro when people are in university they take notes there might be somebody here taking notes on what i say now although you're doing it with a phone so you'll get the best recording but if you take notes, did you get every word? So what's the likelihood that millennia ago, someone standing there listening to Jesus? But even if they didn't get every word, they would get the just. Yeah. Which is fine. You have a sermon, and have a ballpoint pen and paper, didn't have any recording devices, managed to get it right. All right. Word for word. Pretty low, which is why some people's apologetics as well, it's a theme. We got the general things. But also, the New Testament scholars suggest that there was some copying going on between the different Gospels which isn't all that surprising, especially when they're telling the same stories. So don't build your house on the sand. Build it on the rock. Great story. Because sand shifts and is changing. It's unreliable. And so are stories. And so are memories. And so are copies of copies of translations of copies of stories and memories. Desert sand, by the way, is useless for making concrete. Beach sand is wonderful for concrete, but you have to add other aggregates and water to make the cement and get it in there. The Bible claims need to be demonstrated to be first good sand. Then we need to add in accurate data and reliable accounts to get anything close to concrete, which simply, in my view, has not happened. What we have is desert sand of dubious reliability. And therefore, while I can't say this didn't happen, I certainly can't say that it probably happened. I have no other resurrections to confirm. The various miracle accounts in the Bible haven't been confirmed, don't have supporting evidence. So what we have are stories. And this ultimately, I think, will come down to, do you believe the story? If you do, then you're going to conclude and engage in priors and Bayesian analysis that the resurrection probably happened. And if you don't believe the story, you're probably going to have a different set of priors. You may even be one of the people, please, atheists, stop doing stuff like this. You may be one of the people, it's impossible, miracles can't happen. You are doing harm uh, when you you do that by suggesting props. Yeah, respect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That you're closed-minded. I have no idea if miracles can happen. I'm just not convinced a possibility has been demonstrated. 30 seconds. Let alone a probability. Thank you. At this time, I don't know if you know this or if anybody told, I think they did tell you. I was texting John. I was telling him, hey, hey, a lot of you and Matt's conversation, private conversation, we could hear. On the oh, I know. In the intermission, people, yeah. I, I heard about that. Yeah, I was texting John like, we can hear, we can hear, we can hear. Like, I know, and then Pete, and then he went off and turned off the hot mic, and people were disappointed. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I, my mindset is like, as much as like the conversation you guys were having, like, I really liked it. My mindset was like, what if they start talking about something that they don't want us to hear? Like, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. No, you got you know that was the right thing to do. It okay. was just funny because people were disappointed. Time we will move into the rebuttal from Than Christopoulos. Rebuttals are how long again? 10 minutes. Yeah, we got, we got time. We can do it. Set the timer for 10 minutes. Nice job, Matt. All right. Is that your rebuttal? Yes, <laughs> I yield my time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. 
All right, guys. Um, first of all, I just want to reiterate, I've given an argument for the reliability of the Gospels in Acts and the New Testament at large. Um, so I just want you to remember that as I go through this. I, I, I understand that was Matt's opening, so he's not directly giving a rebuttal to the argument that I just gave in my opening statement. I'm patiently waiting for that in his rebuttal phase. So if I, if I sound nitpicky or anything like that, I'm just doing a rebuttal, and that's what I got to do. Um, so one of the things that Matt said was that we have a, well, a few different issues with the Gospels. One of them being that, I um, believe you said, eyewitness testimony is not reliable. There's a small problem with this. We're leaving out part of that statement, which is we know when eyewitness testimony is unreliable. Here are some marks of unreliability. The events happen quickly over a period of time, uh, over, over seconds or minutes. The participants are strangers to one another. And if there's a weapon... I got to tell you, um, oh, do you know, you know Jordan? He, yeah, he, he showed up there. He he, yeah. he sent me a message um, beforehand, and he's like, the difference uh, between, um, you know, somebody who knows what they're talking about and somebody who doesn't, and it was you up on stage going through your notes, and Matt standing in the audience talking to a, <laughs> talking to somebody in the crowd just chilling, and, and I don't know. I just thought that was the funniest thing in the world. But now that you and Matt are friends, I guess you're not allowed to laugh at that because you've been making fun of him, so... <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um no dude I, I that that was like part of part of the hardest part of the debate is like i as somebody that is the person that's arguing for the resurrection i had a lot more stuff to data to have ready yeah right and that's that's one of the reason i hate resurrection debates because it's like okay well let me go to my section of my notes about memory really quick here and i like that was hard. I didn't know how to. I didn't know how to play that better. Maybe the next one you should do should just be reliability of the gospels. Just maybe just that presence, such as a knife or gun, that also is an instance where reliability of a testimony can be scrutinized. If there's a gun in front of you, you're typically going to be focused on the weapon instead of what's going on with everybody else. None of these conditions are present for the resurrection appearances, though. Another point that I wanted to go out over was um, Matt brought up a contradiction, and that was. Um, how many women were at the tomb. So if we look at the passages, we have John 20, verse 1, Matthew 28, verse 1, and Mark 16, verse 1, Luke 24, verse 1. And so I'll just kind of read through kind of a brief here that I have on this. Um, rule number one of reading anything, especially the Bible, is never read one verse. All we need to do is keep reading to see that this isn't the case at all with this contradiction. We know um, what's going on here if we just put everything together. So for instance, in John 20, verse 2, it says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. But then where did that we come from if Mary Magdalene was alone? Um, I can spend a lot of time on gospel contradictions here, but I don't want to devote too much time here to all those. I've answered that in a lot of different places in my work, and many other cr Christians have answered that as well. But the main thing I just wanted to point out there is that there's reasonable answers to a lot of these alleged discrepancies. Um, Matt also brings up um, now that, and this is a point of agreement, that when we're talking about Bayesian analysis, we want to have good priors. And I agree that people can make mistakes when they're assessing the prior probability of some type of an event. But the nice thing about Bayesian analysis, and I think this will be another point of agreement between Matt and I, is that we can look at the evidence sequentially and update the prior probability. Um, and then eventually keep getting closer to what the prior probability of the event should be and that final probability of the event would be. That's really nerdy math stuff, but I think Matt and I would agree with on that. Okay, cool. Um, Matt also brings up uh, a really interesting point, and I actually really value this, and it's related. I don't know if we can get into this during our cross-examination or open discussion area, but pretty much he says if this is what happened, this would be the most single important event in history. So why is that even subject to debate? Now, one thing that I might say is Matt is making an implicit claim here, and that is that if God exists and this is real, um, he would want this to be presented in a way that's just provable, not debatable. Um, after all, perhaps, Though God might have good reasons for wanting this to be in the epistemic middle ground, giving us enough evidence to warrant or justify belief, but not such that it forces belief. Now, skeptics and atheists might, and I'm not saying Matt's going to do this, but people will often kind of call these things excuses rather than reasons. But what I would contend is that relabeling this as an excuse doesn't magically make the reason I'm giving not work. Um, we have to show why these reasons don't explain the data, or why positing those explanations lowers the probability of God's existence. Um, besides, at least at best, then, this might be weak evidence against the resurrection indirectly by trying to lower the probability of God's existence. Um, but if Matt wants to have a debate on, Matt, on divine hiddenness, I'm happy to set that up, too. Um, but for now, I want to focus on... I would love to see that. <laughs> <coughs> I'm joking, I spit. Just keep going. <laughs> resurrection Jesus. And one last thing I want to note here is, though, that this type of objection actually kind of reinforces a point that I'm trying to make here on conditional probabilities. Um, it, it, the, the main point I want to get here is that Matt is making a claim here about what God would do and it's pointing to data that references a degree of support or lack of support for this God claim based on this intuition we have about God, what God would and wouldn't do. So we don't need statistical data of what God would or wouldn't do, but we, so what we have is the ability to make these conditional statements about the data and form degrees of support the data offers. Um, what else? I, I also have an issue when people do like the God would statements, unless you like have a philosophical like foundation on why yeah. it would happen, but it's like God would do it because I would do it. Well, you don't know that like like we, we can't look at everybody in the world and assume that they would behave in the way that we would behave so we can't do that with god either 
right? Like, like you, like you made the argument here that God may have many reasons he would do it. And people say, that's an excuse. Well, that's fine. You would do it differently, but you're not God. Yep. hundred percent. Um, Matt also says that we're like, you're not having enough evidence that we not don't have enough evidence. And this is, I think one of the places that we disagree with a lot. Um, Matt might be coming at this from a different methodological perspective than I will be. So me as a Bayesian, I'm looking at posterior likelihood ratios and conditionalizing those with the... Uh, with is this why you always say the word based? No. Okay, I was just curious if there was like a play on words there. No. Okay. But I do, but I do make the play on words a lot. All right. Bayesian. The hypothesis. Yes. Now, Matt, that doesn't require me to have so much evidence that I prove something. If I have, in a Bayesian analysis, hypotheses that are logically exhaustive of the data I'm trying to explain, if the, if the probability is higher than the rest of the competing theories, even if the probability of the theory is 0.5, I've logically exhausted the option, and I've logically exhausted the options. The most reasonable thing to do is to believe the thing with the highest probability. We can probably get into that into the weeds a little bit more in our open discussion here. Um, and this is where I want you guys to remember something. Math methodology might be different than mine, and we can talk about those methodological disputes. But I want you guys to remember those three questions that we asked in the beginning of my opening statement. What are the odds? What's the prior probability of a resurrection to Jesus? And that's something we can get into about how we assess that. Um, what are the odds of the evidence if Jesus did not rise from the dead? And what are the odds of the evidence if Jesus um, did rise from the dead? Um, Matt also brought up that memory is unreliable, and I probably don't have all the time in the world to kind of go through all this, this stuff. But for one, I'm, in, in his opening, Matt didn't really give too many studies for this claim, but I have a plethora of research. And here's, here's the issue with his, his opening, too. It's like it forced you to make arguments that wasn't really the point of like what you were talking about because you had like this whole Bayesian idea of like the probability of like, like, like you just said there. What is the probability we would see this stuff if he didn't resurrect? Yeah. What is the probability we see this stuff if he did resurrect? You, d- you didn't really get the focus on that. You had to like touch on all these sort of like apologetic things that have been touched on a million times and it didn't allow you to bring your argument to light. Do you, do you feel the same? Yeah, I didn't really know how to interact with it like and how to bring it back to my argument. I just didn't know. There's probably a way to do it. I just didn't know what, how to do it. Yeah, this is, your, first debate, this is your like, first one, right? Yeah. And the fact that it's going against Matt Dillhunty on your first is like mad props, dude. Like, like that's like that's like uh, being a cage fighter and saying you're going to go against uh, Conor McGregor your first time. <laughs> like, you, it's just not something you do. You usually take a few rounds of some, we call them smokers in the fight world, right? Like you, yeah. you go against people like you know you're going to win against and it kind of gives you that confidence and that feel of the cage. And, and then when you step into it, and maybe this actually might be like a piece of advice I can give you. Maybe take some debates where you know you're going to just walk on people and, and <laughs> go down that route because it's going to give you like here, here's where Matt has you and I'm not trying to like insult you. Oh yeah, yeah. he's just, just a really, really good debater. Really good debater and and his public presence, right? Like yeah. I could tell in certain areas you're a bit nervous and like uh, trying to just keep it cordial and trying to figure out all the other things that were like outside of the debate and that's there's nothing wrong with that, man. But I mean if like if you take some time and just like go against like, you know, your debate with Mike I don't count that. (laughs) I know you don't count that, but if you had like a debate like that, like in a public forum, very similar to this, and you do that a few times, and then you can go back in like with, with Matt on, um, on, for example, divine hiddenness, because you got the knowledge tenfold, bro, tenfold, but where you're going to lose some of the skeptics is just like, they're, they're already there looking for a reason to hate you. Like yeah, they, yeah. they, they're there and they like, Jordan sent me some videos of some guys in the audience doing some weird things. Like they, they're not there to be your friend. So you, you gotta, what's, I don't, I don't want to get into it, but we'll talk about right, it. We're going to have to tell me it privately. Um, but like they're there to hate you. So you can't give them anything at all that they can use as a weapon by any means. So that's like where you were talking about, like how you did, um, self-deprecation, yeah. right? Like from people who like you and are your friend they're going to like, haha, that's funny. That's Than, right? Right. I love Than. But the people who are there to like hate you, they're going to see that and say, oh, of course, look at this guy. Look, look, look. He's X, <laughs> Y, and Z. What, a, what an asshole. Right. And then they're, they're just going to use that and go like, but if you can like s- step in front of that crowd and like, I think somebody who did it really well, like if you go watch Matt Dillahunty's debate with Trent Horn, and I'm sure, you, did you hear that? I think it was on yeah, the resurrection. Yeah. If you go read the comments because of how well Trent Horn spoke and was put together and was ready to go, uh, everybody in that comment section was like, I disagree with Trent, but I really appreciate how he did this, right? Yeah. J- just simply from how the conversation is handled because you're not saying anything different than Trent, right? Like 
like, well, you're doing it like in a different argument. But what I mean yeah. is what I'm talking of like level of knowledge here. There's, there's nothing like you guys are, in my opinion, here and mm -hmm. here when you're having your discussions. Uh, the only thing that separates you is just his experience on, on yeah. the on the mic. You didn't take like you didn't take that as me shitting on you, did you? Not at all. Okay, cool. I, I sometimes I can be harsher than I, I feel like you should know me well enough by now that I'm not, I'm not going to take it that way. Okay, cool. So just kind of help us here. Uh, for starters, the data we currently have um, is not enough to make sweeping generalizations about memory. And the methodology we have used to collect data thus far is actually somewhat skewed. For example, sometimes studies focus on tasks that are difficult to retain, and others have attempted to induce false memories that don't accurately map onto the reality of how we typically retain information. Gillian Cohen, in a paper titled Memory in the Real World on page 389, says that the experiments go so far as to say that in experiments, it's usually more informative to set a task difficulty at a level where people make errors, so the nature of the errors and conditions that provoke them can be identified. In fact, we have several studies where the expected reports of memories to be 40% accurate, but they were surprised to find that they were, that they were closer to 93 to 95% accurate. Oh, wow. Some of these studies include a case of study of eyewitness testimony memory crime by Yuli, JC, and Kutschel, um, memory of a randomly sampled autobiographical events by Brewer William F. The truth is out there, accuracy and recall of variable real-world events, and so on. The other thing that to note is that the reliability of memory is going to be dependent on the type of memory that is formed in the person's mind, remembering that the person who sat adjacent to you at lunch who wore a blue shirt is much different than, for instance, the day of your wedding. So the former will not produce reliable memory, while the latter does. As Dr. Robert McIver says, most psychological experiments on memory focus on periods of seconds and minutes rather than periods as long as 30 to 60 years that most likely intervened between the crucifixion resurrection and writing the Gospels furthermore. The stimulus materials usually used in psychological experiments are quite different. So here's a question for you real quick. Um, you had, it looks like you had this prepared, but you didn't know that he was going to bring this up? No. So like, how, how did you do that? You just prepared for it just in case? Yeah. So how many things did you prepare for that he didn't bring up? Uh, I don't know. I can tell you that I had 170 pages. Of just oh, like, no. if he says this, I'm going to go here. Yeah. Wow. D props. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, send you my I'll send you my doc later. But like, I had 48 objections anticipated. That's, that's insane. And then he uh, didn't, he didn't even bring notes. What a guy. No, he brought notes. He had I'm a notebook. Just, I'm just I'm just playing, bro. Okay. From the materials found in synoptic gospels. For time's sake, I won't go over all the types of memories out there, but the resurrection appearances would fall under the category of something called personal event memories, or PEMS for short. The research has shown that important emotionally impacting, life-changing events form memories that are retained well for decades. Um, Doctor of Psychology at University of New Hampshire, David B. Pilmer, lays out the criteria for what counts as a PEM, um, and I don't have time to read this all off right now, so Matt, if you want to go over that at some point, we can. Um, but these are the types of memories that we form from a person defining personal experiences, trauma or key experiences with loved ones. And these are the types of memories that the people who are eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus would have had. So while I appreciate this general, this general gesture to memory being unreliable, we're, I'm, more, I'm more wanting to know what type of memory these eyewitnesses would have had. And it seems to me, based off the research, if these testimonies are what the original eyewitnesses said and these One minute. were the places that they were, a PEM is the type of memory that these people most likely have had, seeing somebody who had just risen from the dead. Um, 40 seconds left. Matt, do you say anything else I should address? <laughs> <laughs> probably not. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just, anything else will probably just compliment a cross-exam. Um, I really appreciate the time here. Give Matt a hand of applause again. He did awesome. Please welcome Matt Dillahunty for his rebuttal. What? Just you dropping the paper. I was just like, I love you, bro. Just like, yeah, I didn't even get that paper. This is great. <laughs> Set the timer to 10 minutes, please. So I'm curious to see well, after he the uses a rebuttal, rebuttal, now that you know the rest of my opening, because you said that your opinion might have changed. We're going to see, because like uh, originally, like, when I scored this, like we were jokingly scoring it, like I'd score an MMA fight. Yeah. I, I gave opening to you, I gave rebuttal to Dillahunty, and then I gave uh, Q and A to you, and I gave cross examination to you, right? But the thing is, the cross examination I gave you a ten eight, right? So if you if we're thinking like MMA, that's that's unheard of. That's like a schooling. That's like a smackdown. That's Fair like enough. that's like you didn't land a punch on your partner and he just threw you across the cage. So like, uh, I think it was like a slam dunk, and and that's like. We're going to get to that before we cut the live because there's one point I really want to focus on. Yeah, yeah. Timer, first of all, this is really nice. Those of you who have seen some of my more recent debates against some people, well, I won't say those words in church. Uh, just out of respect for you guys, invite me down. Uh, this is, uh, we're no longer doing Jerry Springer debates, so amen, praise the Lord, whatever. <laughs> oh, right. I'm losing time. So on uh, Bayesian analysis, here's the thing. If you found out that somebody had a baby and you were going to try and estimate what the probability was that the baby was a boy, you can just put it at 50%. For all my non-binary friends, I'm saying approximately, and we're talking about something different. But uh, 
What if you found out that the baby's name was Sue? Well, that changes the probability that it's a boy a bit, because Sue is a rather unusual name for a boy, and that might lower it. This is where uh, Than and I are both in agreement that one of the great things about Bayesian analysis is that you are constantly updating what, you could have the most ridiculous priors you wanted, as long as they're not like zero or 100%, and as long as you are constantly adding new information, you are revising your priors so that you're honing in on what is the most reliable or most accurate probability. Obviously. Cool. They want to find out that uh, Johnny Cash wrote a song called A Boy Named Sue. Does that change the weight? Well, sure. It might make it more likely or less likely, kind of a matter of your opinion. But then, after you know that that song's been out and got popular, are people going to actually start naming their boys Sue or giving them Sue as a middle name? But, so there's lots of different ways to address those things. What if you're trying to calculate the, the probability that I have a time travel machine? Well, I don't know what probability you start with, but let's start with really, really low. Uh, and then when you say, hang on a minute ago, uh, you know, just last week your beard was much shorter. How did it get so long so quickly? Well, maybe that increases the chance that I have a, a time machine. Uh, pro pro probably not. The point is, though, you can calculate the probability of what you presume the, the odds are that I have a time machine. And what if you start really low and you're right? Versus what if you start really high and you're wrong and then no new data comes in? So now you have a bad prior and no way to update it to make your conclusion more accurate. This problem of data disappearing seems to apply specifically to single event historical claims that don't have comparable claims, like the origin of the universe. We've got one universe we can investigate. We don't get to compare it to any others. There's no data coming in from other universes. And claims about resurrections. The problem with trying to assess the resurrection, as recorded in the Gospels, is there's no new data, and there's been no new data, for the entirety of the time that the claim's been around. It is just what the Gospels say. And you can say, oh, there's 21 witnesses, yes, accounted in those stories. There's also 500 others that never wrote a thing or said a thing that we know of. Maybe if we found one of those, then we would have an ability to actually update our, our priors with new data. But we seem to be stuck. With her. Yeah, uh, so I think me missing your opening statement did a lot. Um, really? I think this is a really good rebuttal still. I'm not, I'm not taking it away, but because he's talking about that data, because I was like, okay, he's making a good point here. We don't have any new data and stuff like that. But now I know, like, because I missed your data. I, I missed what, you, like, in your opening, mm -hmm. like I got, like I said, again, the meat was gone. I missed the data that you went through. I went through, we heard, uh, what did we hear? We heard how Bayesian works. And then we heard the reliability of the gospels and an argument for the priors and the argument for the priors. Yeah. So we, we missed a lot. Why God would become incarnate, what that would look like. Jesus is the only one that fits in within that reference class. Right. So he's not wrong. He's still not wrong. What he's saying. We don't have any new data coming in, but what you're doing is you're providing new data. He might not have known of, which I think is kind of like, well, so, on. Yeah, yeah. So the reason, so this is tough because I don't know how you're supposed to judge a debate, right? Because like he's he's bringing up a good point, but I answer that point in the cross exam. You do, yeah. And and the, like, but and I'm trying not to think about that right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that that's that's the part where I'm like, how do you judge that? <laughs> yeah, but like you said, and and that's that's where I think the hail mary is is actually when you answer that in the cross exam. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. With regard to data. Then, uh, kind of, I think incorrectly, suggested that I was making a claim about God, what God would or wouldn't do. I don't think I addressed God or what God would or wouldn't do at any point uh, during the opening. And I don't think it's relevant because the debate is about whether or not the resurrection is it. But he did, though. He did make that claim. He said, if God exists, I'd expect to see more hmm. solid evidence. So, A historical event, not how it happened. God is irrelevant to whether or not the resurrection happened, whether or not we have good reason to conclude that a resurrection happened. As a matter of fact, as soon as you add in the also undemonstrated God, you are smuggling in potential bias both to your priors and to what data you're willing to consider. God's existence is irrelevant to whether or not it happened. It may be relevant to how it happened, but that's not what this debate is, and that's not the probability that we're calculating. Did yeah, it happen? And I, that's but, something I just like very hard disagree with, obviously. Yeah. Because... I, we kind of laughed too because we're like, oh, now he wants to stay on point. <laughs> like, like that, that, was a, that was another thing we kind of giggled at because he's like, we're not talking about God's existence. We're talking about the resurrection. Well, they kind of go hand in hand in what we're saying. But sorry, go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, nothing. I would just hard disagree with that because, right, like my whole claim is if God exists, then he would, mo he would most likely become incarnate. This is most likely what you would, what you would expect to see. Jesus fits this, right? Yeah. But all of this is conditional on God's existence. So it's it's very relevant. Yeah. And and again, if people are resurrecting from the dead uh, from a natural basis, not a supernatural basis, not like from a transcendent being, then we would expect to see it happening more often. Well, you could theoretically argue that there's like some sort of like non-God divine being, hmm. like an angel that could do it or something like that. Like, 
you might pause at something like that. It's just the simplicity that you're going to take a huge simplicity hit. That that's fine, but my point was that it's not natural. It doesn't fall to the natural world. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah totally. Yeah. So so like but either way we're positing this god, right? The question is what how do you define god after that? Either way we're saying there's something that transcends what we're in. Yeah. Versus how did it happen? Two very different questions. I've done call-in shows for almost, almost 20 years, 19 or so. People call in all the time to tell me all kinds of stories. I've heard about, well, just a week or so ago, this guy had a, a ball of energy pulsing in front of him at the exact moment his dad died and was convinced that that was his dad's soul, that it had traveled how long, how far? 700 kilometers. That was his big point. 700 kilometers was really very, very important. I've had people tell ghost stories, alien abduction stories. What's the probability that people are getting abducted by aliens? And as we go around and listen to the stories and the similarities in the stories, doesn't it become incredibly more likely What's the probability on an alien abduction that we would have these accounts? Probably pretty high. But that's different from what is the probability on these accounts that alien abductions are actually occurring. The same thing is true for probability with respect to a resurrection. If there is a resurrection, we would expect with a high probability that there would be people claiming that there was a resurrection. There would be people claiming there was an empty tomb because why on earth would you think that the tomb wasn't empty if you thought that somebody had resurrected? There would be claims that would be consistent with it because inconsistent claims, as Than demonstrated when he talked about uh, Simon Bar Coppa, uh, no resurrection claims there, cool. Same is true for everybody that's ever died in my family, but you, you, that doesn't change or alter what sort of data and information we're adding to refine the probabilities. So the odds of evidence or testimony. And one thing I appreciate about this rebuttal is it really, sh he, it shows that he actually gave you respect attention. and listened to you. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. Um, this was, there were a couple of things he mentioned in his opening and since I'm doing a rebuttal, I'm going to try to hit those. One is that he seemed to suggest, I think, uh, on a slide, I don't know if you said it um, out there, uh, that, that was the, the risk of presenting a testimony of potentially being martyred and killed increases its, its strength, or surprising, I think was the word that you used on, on the slide. Um, and I would agree that that may increase how surprising it is, but it's not in any way relevant to how true it is, because you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. And there have been plenty of people who've been willing to... And this is what we talked about uh, earlier in the live, right? Is that um, there is, like, people can be sincere and sincerely wrong, yeah. but there is no natural, like, natural explanation why somebody would be convinced that they hung out with Jesus for 40 days after he died and then were well, willing to die on that account. Yeah, and so like the whole, okay, maybe they were sincere, right? But they were sincerely wrong. That takes you to the other logically exhaustive option. They, they were mistaken. Yeah. Right, which is like basically hallucination hypothesis. But the thing, right? again, it makes no sense that they would do that for 40 days. Right, and, and that's the whole point. Yeah. So... Um, that's where I think that this didn't really truly interact with my case because I'm not making deductive arguments here where I'm saying like necessarily they're, um, sincere, therefore necessarily it's true, right? I'm saying on a probabilistic scale, if you, if you have like a, a square that represents all the probability space and you take all the considerations, the likelihood of all the considerations really favors the resurrection over the other competing theories. And you have to take the totality of everything, all the considerations, not just hostility. And that's it. If that makes sense. Yeah. I Cause agree. evidence has interacted with each other. Chat, you've been quiet, but I know you guys are watching y'all still with us or what? They're falling asleep. <laughs> just kidding. It is late. Fight and die for things that are bad. Fight and die for things that aren't potentially true. The, the truth isn't impacted by the number of people believe it, how long they believed it, the strength of their convictions. Our only assessment is about the actual evidence. And while it's neat that they're, uh, neat's probably a bad word, although, uh, who cares? I'll say worse at some point. My, I meant to say at the beginning, I'm, I'm not intending to offend anybody, but it's probably gonna happen. So I'm sorry in advance, but I'm actually not that sorry because I'm just saying what I think and what's the truth. And if that's a problem, that's your problem. Um, but on the issue of the reliability memory, this is something that I addressed uh, specifically with regard to mem memory that might be decades later trying to recall a sermon that you heard. Now. The standard apologetic is that God preserved all this and that Jesus, by virtue of being divine. That's the standard apologetic, but I don't think that's your apologetic. That's not what I gave, yeah. No, by any means. Spoke in a way that didn't just resonate with people, but empowered them to remember it and be moved by it. And therefore, we have really good reason to believe that when the Bible says Jesus said this and we put it in red letter, that the person who was writing this down was guided by God and reaffirmed by God, even if they were taking notes off somebody else who wrote as well. But all of that begins with an assumption that there is in fact a God. Once again, we are injecting the bias of a potential explanation for something extraordinary when that explanation hasn't demonstrated that it is possible or true. So what we're doing is multiplying anecdotes. Here's an anecdote. We're going to add it to this one. We're going to multiply it by this one. This one strengthens this one, strengthens this one. And this is why you have this collection of books that is presumed to be guidance on a single narrative. 
Everything from the creation, our fall, to the redemption. And then we ignore the parts of the story that don't make sense because, well, God's got his reasons. Uh, Estadian Canada, Oos, I think it was. We're going to get to that. That's going to be like our, our final hurrah for the night. Or we'll find out later. Or God's ways are not our ways. Well, one of the verses from Romans that I like is, let God be true and every man a liar. Of course, the problem is, that verse was written by a man too, as was every other verse. So when God shows up to actually say something, I'll listen and I'll try to evaluate whether or not I think God's truthful. Because that's an assumption as well. The last thing that I'm going to offer a quick rebuttal to in my last minute was a sli slide that they ended on uh, Swinburne, where basically he structured an argument that Swinburne's case is that uh, God would take the best kind of action and thus taking human form and doing all these things that are attributed to Jesus' life is the best sort of action. Except that none of that has anything to do with a resurrection or the likelihood or the probability of a resurrection, except that you're trying to potentially smuggle a God in as an explanation. But if God would... Do you want to address that? Yeah, I would just say that's flat out wrong. Um, he doesn't... Like, aside... So, does he... I don't remember. Does he give a reason why it has nothing to do? Or does he just say that? Let's see. Let's see. Because then... That'll he would actually do the best that. thing. Wouldn't the best thing be not requiring a torturous blood sacrifice that needs to be accepted based on the worst possible okay, evidence? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, that doesn't really. So, so there's there's, two, there's a few things going on here actually. Um, on one end, he's saying it has nothing to do with the resurrection, right? But the problem is, I have actually outlined like a logical um, string of conditional statements. If God exists then he would do this. If he did this, then this is what you would expect his life to look like. If this is what you would expect his life to look like, the candidate pool of God incarnate throughout history restricts down to Jesus, right? right? And one of the things that's there is that he would be, his claims of divinity and all this other stuff would be vindicated by some sort of miracle that would tell us like, yeah, his promise from salvation of, from death well, that sounds like something like a resurrection, right? Again, doesn't it? It's not an entailment, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just like this does raise the prior probability that God would send somebody like Jesus to raise from the dead, right? And it's a well, bare minimum, it's not smuggling, exactly, right? That that bare minimum, it's not that. So I don't think that was fair to say. Yeah, and then some from there, um, he actually switches and says, "No, the best type of thing would have been this, right?" which we can we him and I can push back on each other on what the best kind of world God can make is and all that stuff right but it that implicit that that next move is actually implicitly endorsing the type of move I'm making he's just switching the value statements that I'm making right. not the actual got what God would do right so he's still attacking the prior but the prior he's making an argument against the prior where I'm making an argument for the prior does right. that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Good. Uh, Instead of the best possible evidence, why wouldn't God just forgive people? Why does God have to come down, take human form, sacrifice himself to himself to serve as a loophole for rules that he's behind? I don't and, th and this is just the what if argument, right? What if this? What if that? What about this? And it's like, again, the, the whole problem with making this argument is that it's irrelevant to like how you feel. Like, I feel like God should have done it this way is completely pointless because like, I know philosophically it's not sound to have like an evil God, but let's say he was an all evil God and a horrible monster. Then yeah, he's an all evil God and a horrible monster and he would behave that way, but it doesn't change the fact that he's God and sovereign over all things and he has control over you. So it's simply saying, if I was God, I would do X will never, ever be a good argument in my mind ever. And I think again, it's just intuition pumps. Yeah, fair enough. I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows. Maybe God knows. And that is time. Give it up for both of our debaters. I just yeah, so I don't know if I would give him the rebuttal. And and I'd say this. I'd say I didn't I don't think you had a fair chance to give him a rebuttal because he was so all over the place. Right? So yeah, like, fair enough. He had a, a really good rebuttal because you could hyper focus on a certain point because you gave a specific point, a specific argument. He was all over the place, so you were kind of had to be all over the place, which yeah. wasn't fair to you. But now knowing like more information on what you said on your opening, I'm I'm giving this all to you, bro. And I'm not just saying that because I'm your friend. 
maybe because I'm biased and a Christian and that's all Christians are. Yeah. We're just, we're just biased. So I'm going to skip ahead. Now we're going to get cool. to the, I'm going to skip the Q and a and wait, I think this is it here. This is the cross exam. Good reasons for keeping an epistemic distance away from us. Um, but making here. Here's for having a very healthy conversation right now, and we are going to continue that with the same rules that we set in the beginning. Please do not interrupt. Please do not uh, throw verbal tomatoes or physical tomatoes. Thank you so much. With that being said, I'm going to set the timer to 10 minutes, please. John, John, if you're watching this later, it's just me on the camera, just me and you right now. Why did you sit there? In, in the right behind the two of them? <laughs> like the way he's like staring at us in the background during the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> It was very, it was like, I just remember watching and just like, and John's sitting there. <laughs> the whole time. I, <laughs> we love you, bro. I don't think I he needed to be there. <laughs> Could have been off the side. Uh, <laughs> let's go. All right, Matt, you may begin. So this is going to be fun because I just have a list of questions which I wrote down ahead of time. And even though I wasn't making any claims about God, uh, here's the first question. Why does God need us to assess probability of the resurrection instead of just confirming it? Yeah, so it, it seems like this is an appeal to a divine hiddenness. Correct me if I'm answering and... A little bit, yes. Okay, cool. So there could be a lot of different reasons, right? For instance, God might have good reasons for caving at us. And so I'll, I'll just say like to you, this is where you shined. Right, like right here, as soon as you were off script... And you were just talking and it was just you and you got excited and you were talking to Matt Dillahunty and like I could, t your inner nerd just came out like this, this is like, you killed it. You shined, you took the show. I was so in love with you. What is you doing? I'm like, he's so dreamy. <laughs> it's like, it was, it was so good, bro. I'm, I'm very proud of how you handled this uh, cross examination. Nice. I, I appreciate that. I hate being on script because then I have to memorize scripts. And yeah. I, I, I think. I think you just naturally flowing is, is much better. Stomach distance away from us, um, but making things such that we do have to assess probabilities, but the likelihood ratio uh, supports his existence, but not so much that it forces belief. Um, so for instance, I would consider what we're doing here a really valuable thing, right? We're, we're sitting here and philosophers like to talk about the true, the good, and the beautiful, right? The alethic domains, the moral domains, and the aesthetic domains. Alethic is like truth value, truth finding domains. Now, I, know, I don't know if you're a moral realist or realist about values or anything. I don't either. Yeah. Um, and so, for at least for me, my like what I'm saying is coming from that perspective, with that stuff in my background knowledge, it seems like the conjunction of God's existence in some sort of value theory would predict something like God wanting a world where we're sitting here and having these really valuable conversations. That'd be a, a brief overview of sure. what I think. So, um, was it unfair? Because because I I view this this thing as particularly unfair, and I've said so before. Why doesn't everybody deserve a Damascus Road experience? Why is I feel like you two had a really good conversation after this. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like, because I could tell, like, your guys' energy right here was very much, I want to talk to each other. Yeah. And so I feel like after this, you guys just kept going. Am I wrong to say that? No, yeah. We just wanted to keep, we just wanted to keep talking. And um, I don't know if you've picked up, you picked up on this, but, like, as the conversation progressed, we just kept on dropping our guards more and more and more. And, like, we had each, we had chances to take jabs at each other. And, and we just didn't, didn't take them. I, th I think if you guys do another conversation, what I would love to see, because I actually really like like how Matt approached this too. I've, I'm big. I'm I like Matt more now after watching this cross examination than I did before. Um, Fair enough. And I, I would I think the two of you, like if you ever do this before on a live, is just sit and like have topics you want to talk about, no script, no nothing, and just have a conversation. Yeah, I think that'd be the way to go. We'll probably do something like that in the future. That'd be dope. So I'll pick out uh, to specifically get an interaction that the rest of us don't. Is that, uh, it sounded like there's, an, there's more coming to that, sorry. No, no, no. That, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the same sort of thing because it sounded to me, pardon me for, for digging in more, but it sounded to me that you're basically saying, we don't really know why God does this, but he's got his reasons. Mm -hmm. And yet, according to scripture, he violates those for some people and not others. And that to me seems ridiculously unfair. Yeah, so to be clear, I want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Is this 
almost like the problem of people who have like access to a miracle account, for instance, like we have, let's just say somebody in here had a religious experience, a Christophany or something like that. And your question is, why do they get it and I don't? Yes. Right. Um, and again, it just Which seems like- I'm not expecting you to have an answer, but that's the point. Yeah. yeah. And so I feel like my answer before that still kind of addresses that. Sure. Um, God might have those types of reasons. And I don't think those two reasons are ad hoc. I think they're actually kind of predicted by those, the conjunction of those two things. So for clarity, the, am I understanding correctly that we don't have extra biblical contemporary accounts that provide any confirmation of the resurrection? Extra biblical? Yeah. Um, I don't know that we need it. So, well, that's not what I asked, though. Well, I would say no, we don't, but I don't think okay. we need it either because I think the evidence supports what we, I'm arguing for on its own. Yeah, I'm, I'm, if you don't think we need it, that's fine. I just want to make sure we're on the same page that it's not there uh, because, you know, when you look at somebody like, uh, the testimony of Flavianum is disputed, yeah. but also it wouldn't matter that much to me because it's not like he cites sources. So, look, I would consider like that kind of stuff very weak evidence because it's so far removed, and somebody like Josephus is reporting something from all, like so far away, and these are who knows how many hand accounts, whereas the Gospels are decades later. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, and you're absolutely right with that too, because a lot of people want to say, why don't we see more from Tacitus and Josephus? Well, it's like, for one, they didn't live in the time period. For two, they yeah. were eyewitnesses. Three, they'd be, they'd be getting their history by looking at other, like most historians back then, they would go to a library and yeah. read what somebody else wrote, and then they would write it down. And that's that's how they did history back then. So to, to say that we need all these other accounts outside i agree with you it is kind of like yeah. ridiculous because jesus was doing all this and all his first-hand accounts would be with the people who are around him who with with people that be christians you wouldn't expect to see some guy off in off in greece writing about jesus and the things that he did unless he was taking it from the sources that were originally yeah. from him and that that's what you're saying right yeah okay, exactly perfect yes yeah, so I'm not terribly interested in what Josephus has to say. My brain keeps doing this. I hit play, and I hear your voice, and I think you're talking to me, and it is messing me up. <laughs> At least on that basis, if that makes sense. Is, is the intrinsic probability of Jesus' resurrection identical to any other resurrection claim? No. Man, I wish we had another 20 minutes to do <laughs> on that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, wouldn't the intrinsic probability of a resurrection be the number of true resurrection claims out of the number, the total number of resurrection claims. Yeah, so uh, this is a really, okay, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> cool. Because now I get to nerd out. Um, I'm going to make you happy. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's multiple ways, and I'm talking to the audience too, because this is really fun. Sorry, I'm just excited. Um, there's multiple ways. So, you're so cute. Look at you. <laughs> it's all <laughs> giddy. It's like, th but this is where you shine, bro. This is it. So it's probably probability. So one of those things, one of the ways that you can do that is by looking at the frequency of the events that you're looking at, right? But that's not the only way, and it might not even be the best way at all times. Um, there's, I have a counter example. I don't want to take up all your time, but I have a counter example, and I have a, uh, an, an argument kind of against that. Um, a counter example would be a standard model particle physics predicts that we would have spontaneous proton decay, but the problem is spontaneous pro proton decay um, is in violation of the law of conservation of energy and matter. And so the long story short is, um, scientists have for decades tried to measure spontaneous pro proton decay, have never ever. Um, witnessed it or observed it or anything, right? But the thing is, the standard model of particle physics predicts it, and we have really good evidence that it does happen. We just never observed it. And so the prior probability, if, if it's the case that we've never observed um, spontaneous proton decay in science, the prior probability, if we measured it strictly on like a frequentist metric or frequency metric, would be really low. So there's some pre-theoretic things. I'm going to do you a favor? Yeah. yeah. Uh, trust me, this is me doing you a favor, because nobody here cares about <laughs> particle physics. I was asking about the intrinsic probability, not the prior. And so, like, the intrinsic probability of a resurrection, that the resurrection's happened, is, it would be the number of true resurrections. I sort control. of wish you would let me finish there. But he did do me a favor because I was so long-winded. You, you, I'm listening back now, and I'm getting what you're saying now. But when I first watched it, I didn't get it. Yo. Like, it, it was going over my head, too. So, like, I thought he was saying, I'm going to do you a favor because no one understands what you're saying. That, that's right, the vibe I got. But, yeah. like, now I'm listening to it again, like, the se second set of years. And... I fully understand what you're saying now, and it, and it makes What sense. do you think I'm saying there now? What, well, you're saying that we have this event that when we're looking at the probabilities that we don't see it happen in real life, but we'd say because of this standard that they've set, they expect it to happen. So you're saying you're, they're applying the Bayesian model here, and they're saying, well, there's, there's, it's probably going to happen even though we haven't witnessed it, and then you're going to apply that to the resurrection as well. Am I wrong? Yeah, so, so to contextualize it a little bit more, um, the way I interpreted Matt right is like he he wants to say something like the prior probability is going to be equal to the amount of like the frequency of resurrections that happened in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And then I start and then I said, well, look, you can try to measure prior priors in that way, but it's not the only way, and sometimes it's not the best way. And then when I and then the reason so that's why I go into the spontaneous proton decay because we've never observed spontaneous proton decay, but we know it probably happens based off of evidence. Right. Right. But if the prior probability 
of spontaneous proton decay, decay based off the frequency of the times we've observed it happening is zero, then no amount of evidence will ever overcome that prior probability. Right. And that's kind of like the counter example. So it's like, okay, so there's other factors at play other than frequency. And sometimes it's not the best. So basically you're kind of saying if, if he's throwing like the resurrection out the window completely, then prior proton decay, like if you, if you can only do it by observing it, then prior proton decay isn't a thing and it's not real. Even though yeah, the exactly. Data says, yeah. Okay. True resurrection. Also, just look at John. Bye -bye. The total number of resurrection claims. So the intrinsic problem <laughs> right, so is. The whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that man though. I do. He's one of a kind. What I'm doing is I'm providing a counterexample to the use of frequency for assessing the intrinsic probability. Okay. So, and, and depending on how we're using the words intrinsic and prior here, I kind of take those to be interchangeable. So maybe you want to. Who? I. Now, so there's the prior probability of a specific resurrection, but the intrinsic probability of resurrections should be however many resurrections happened out of how many resurrections were claimed. It would be a mistake to say how many resurrections out of how many people died. That would not be the probability. This is one of those yeah. areas Correct me if I'm where... Wrong, but that seems... so I this got is one of those... there. I thought you were talking. <laughs> no, no, you're good, you're good. This is one of those areas where the de a debate format was not good because this was a really deep in the weeds topic. Yeah. Uh this distinction between prior probabilities and intrinsic probabilities and then which probability theory we're working off of and all this other stuff. There's so much room for talking past each other there. You wouldn't be good if you guys were at odds with each other. Yeah. And that's yeah. why I, tr that's why I just tried to move us past that and just kind of like find some more points where we can actually make progress. Like I, like I said, this, I, I love this part. This is my favorite part of your guys' debate. Seems to be a conflation between Bayesian statistics. Like, this is very much um, Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. I haven't watched that debate. I, I highly recommend you do it, not because you're going to learn anything crazy new, but w what you might learn is just um, um, conversation and crowds and things like that. You might learn from that aspect, not like new Bayesian models or anything. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Statistic inference and a frequentist statistic inference. Yeah, it's not. This wasn't a basic question. This was about the intrinsic. So it's, okay, so you're asking a frequentist. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, that's great. Yeah. So then I would agree with you. If I'm a frequentist, but I'm not, um, I would agree with you. But I think there's good reasons to not be a frequentist in this kind of a scenario. Okay. Um, if you want me to give you that. Remind me when we're done. I, I have a video to send you that I don't completely understand. <laughs> that you would love. Um, <laughs> you guys can make fun of me for liking math a bunch. I'm the Greek guy there's, that's balding and my glasses. There. Like, <laughs> there's a video out there that. See, I don't think you should say things like that. Don't don't do yeah. that anymore. Like, okay. never, ever again, when you're on like a public, for, like, in, like in a conversation like this, if you want to throw that kind of comment out, cause it's just me and you and it's the chat and things like that, that's fine. But like in that public forum, never, ever belittle yourself. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Yes, Dad. I think everybody should probably watch, it, but it's probably unfair for me to direct you all to it. So go check out my social media at some point. I'll post it there. It's called Craig's Calamitous Cockup. And it is about William Lane Craig's objections to Bart Ehrman's claims when they got into Bayesian probability. But this goes through and, and describes the difference between the intrinsic probability and priors and ends up showing that the math, whether you use long form or short form, works out to be essentially the same. And, that, and also, I want you to know you're a very beautiful man. Thank you. Yes, you should know this. That makes it so that the, the probability of any resurrection and the probability of Jesus' resurrection being true are fundamentally identical. It on both yeah. estimates. Yeah. yeah, I would just really hard to disagree with that. Yep. And Obviously. Maybe we'll go through it sometime. <laughs> I, I don't think we're going to get to we it. We can here. do that on, on our I own time. Bring it. Uh, I doubt people want to listen to us go through long-form calculus. Is, this is an obnoxious thing that I want to raise just to hear what your answer is. I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a mythicist. <laughs> I think mythicists are overreaching, a burden of proof that they can't meet. But I have friends who are mythicists, and some of them are well-read. I appreciate that. Well-written, mm -hmm. and one of them being Richard Carrier. I should say Dr. Richard Carrier, just in case, not that it matters. He wrote a book called Proving History that basically argues uh, for using Bayesian analysis to determine um, events from history. It's too much. I did not finish reading it. Sorry, Rick. But he then went on to use Bayesian analysis to assess the historicity of Jesus. And I believe that his conclusion was that there's, I think it's roughly an 80% probability that Jesus never existed. He, he came to about lower than 0.5, I think, is what he argued. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So See, that just shows how much of a G you are. He's, he's just talking about this outlier book off in nowhere were from like a mythicist perspective and you knew like a, you knew his reference and like were able to quote it and give the exact thing oh i got I actually got the number off by a little bit i think it was a point four. Oh but... lord oh my goodness oh you're so dumb fan you're so <laughs> stupid okay you, you said it was point five and it was point four how, how dumb you are oh geez this is what happens when you don't finish 
But his conclusion was that it was at least likely that Jesus never existed. In much the same way that I, oh, I'm running out of time. So when I, when I did the, the assessment of Bayesian analysis and I talked about essentially data running out and the uniqueness of events, if, if it turns out that resurrection isn't possible and that perhaps Jesus didn't exist, at least in the way that we recorded, does that change anything about the, the Bayesian analysis that you presented on whether or not the resurrection likely occurred? Yeah. Uh, so can I really quickly... Take all the time okay. because I ran out. Let's really quickly to speak... Yeah, regardless the, of the time, uh, please answer the question. Really quickly to speak on the Richard Carrier thing. Um, I, I read Carrier's book and I like it a lot, actually. The one thing is just, I disagree with, obviously, his inputs. Just like any tool, we can misuse it and come to wrong conclusions, right? Um, scientists try to prove a flat earth by using science and you think you and I would agree that they're wrong. So, um, remind me of your question again. <laughs> Here's a thought. Does anybody remember the question? Can you say it word for word? Is your memory good enough? I, okay, so full disclosure, I, you already know this, but like I got hit by a truck when I was younger, so some, sometimes my I memory sucks. That. Oh, really? Yeah, no. sometimes my memory sucks. So I texted Matt today, and I was just like, hey, just a side note, like, in the future, if I ever just forget something on a spot like that, that should not be forgotten, that's probably why. <laughs> I, d I didn't know that. That's wild, bro. Yeah, yeah. Man, well, I'm, I'm surprised you're so knowledgeable and things and if you got like a problem with memory loss no it's not like memory loss it's just like i don't i don't know how to explain it it's just like sometimes things fog up and i don't also explain it is it is it like a brain damage or is it like a anxiety thing i have no clue but it was ever since i got hit by the truck can you explain the fog what it feels like yeah so like in that moment there i remember I remember like he was he there's it was a long winded question and I remember knowing what the question was and then I thought I need to address this first and then it was like my memory was just wiped. I'm sure it's not just happened. ADD. It could be, but that, that's a symptom of AD, ADD as well, but like like when you're talking about a fog, like are you talking like do you get like disconnected from yourself at all or no? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Do do you have like um like any numbness? What? Do you have like any numbness? No. No, nothing like that. Okay. We we'll talk more about it later because now yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated by that. Um. I want to get to your question. All right. I think we hit most of my my concerns. All right. Um. So in my opening statements, I kind of pressed a trilemma, um, which I know a lot of people might not like that type of trilemma because in your experience, you you probably run into like the minimal facts type argument for the resurrection, mm -hmm. and I would agree with you that there's other hypotheses you can put up without. Sorry, somebody in the TikTok chat said, ADD brought on from getting hit by a truck. The <laughs> <laughs> uh. reliability in your testament. I put up a trilemma. And so with those options, either they were, they were, their claims were true, they were mistaken, or they were lying. Do you think one of those two other theories are more likely than the resurrection? So I don't, oh, it helps if you actually hold the mic up where people can hear you. Um, there's a, whew. I'll try and do this as quickly as yeah. I can. Generally speaking, um, as a skeptic, my position is to put the burden of proof where it should be. And so in much the same way that if you walk into a courtroom, the burden of proof is on demonstrating guilt. But failure to demonstrate guilt doesn't mean that you're innocent. And so when I look at the accounts in the Bible, I am not convinced that they are accurate with respect to what happened, but they may be accurate with respect to uh, what people thought happened. So for example, when somebody tells me um, they experienced a ghost, I'm happy to believe that they... So that's actually a huge thing that he just conceded. Um, he just conceded that it's very possible that the gospels are accurate in what they thought happened, mm -hmm. which, which means he's, in, he's implying an honesty in the gospels, which, which I think is a huge thing for him to like now start having to like refute. Uh, like it kind of gives him a burden of proof now, I think, because now they're being genuine, then you have to ask the question, if, how did they genuinely come to the conclusion that Jesus resurrected yeah. from the dead. Um, but maybe he just kind of misspoke there, right? I give him a little bit of grace. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't remember what I did after this answer either. So let's see. They experienced something and that they are perhaps trying to honestly give the best assessment of what it was, but I don't agree with the conclusion that they reached. That's a little problematic, I admit, when it comes to the Gospels, except that I, I view these as stories and I have no way of determining how likely or truthful they are because there isn't independent confirmation outside of it. And since- Okay, yeah, so fair enough. He doesn't fully say that they're honest. He says it's yeah. possible. Yeah. The evidence suggests that they were relying on each other as well. Uh, and, and there's some question as to whether or not the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain were the same sermon delivered at different times at the same time and things like that. But I'm fine with there was some sermon in some person. 
I'm not convinced that I have an accurate representation of what those, the people who reportedly wrote this mm -hmm. actually thought, because I don't know what's changed. You mentioned that we don't have uh, anonymous originals, but that's because we don't have originals. Sure, but on condition that we, that we know who the Gospels authors were, we would expect to see the type of evidence that we have, so the likelihood ratio favors traditional authorship given the evidence we have versus not. But this is, this is that difference in methodology, right? Yeah. Because I'm a Bayesian, and so I'm pointing out the logically exhaustive options, and I'm saying conditional on the evidence, uh, conditional on the hypotheses we're testing for versus com given the evidence, we, I'm saying that the likelihood ratio favors the resurrection versus those logically exhaustive options. Now, I'm fine, because if you're just not convinced that the Gospels are reliable, I'm fine asking, I'm fine changing that question to conditional questions. Like, if the Gospels are reliable, for instance, I don't and, think they're sufficient. Okay, and then that's going to be a difference in methodology, yep. though, right? Because, um, for instance, if would you let's do, let's, let's do this. Um, Methodology-wise, logically exhaustive options, the most probable, even if it's just 0.4 for probability, if I find probability, but the rest are like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, whatever, isn't that, isn't that the most rational thing to do, to believe? No, I'd say the most rational thing, if nothing rises above um, a 0.5 probability, is to say we don't know what happened. We, we don't have so sufficient evidence. So we have the logically exhaustive options. And we have logically exhaustive options, but that doesn't mean that we have sufficient data to determine how those things, maybe, this is, this is what I was talking about with as the data diminishes, maybe the potential uh, alternate hypotheses, maybe one of them should be a higher probability, but we don't have any way to explore it and investigate. Yeah, we're just going based off what we do know, yeah, right? Based off what we do know, it's like... But isn't that not, is that not what we do in science, for instance? No, because you don't have to reach a conclusion. If, so if you're saying, there's a, there's a famous example about Bayesian analysis of, uh, if you hear a uh, like noise wanna... coming from the attic, um, I feel like you wanted to uh, push back there, and I think you pulled your punch. Like, I feel like he kind of annoyed you. Am I wrong? He didn't annoy me. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I pulled back. And you could probably actually, you could even see it in my body language there. Yeah, I, I very much see that you were like, that's a ridiculous statement, but I'm going to pull back on it and let him go. Yeah. On hearing the noise, the probability of their gremlins in your attic bowling is low. But on the, on the knowledge that gremlins are bowling in your attic, the probability is high that you would hear that noise. In, in a similar fashion, the, if in fact we don't have enough data to be confident that we have adjusted our priors to something that is representative of the totality of experience, then we just don't have enough data to reach a conclusion. And as frustrating as it is, it's not like I'm saying God doesn't exist, God didn't create the universe, Jesus didn't resurrect. I'm saying I don't have sufficient evidence to do that because what we have are stories and no new data. And the thing that what, frustrates... What do you mean by new data? And this here. This is your Hail Mary. This is your... You got him on the ropes. This is the... This for me was the end all be all where I was like, <laughs> bro, the, the, you killed it here. Now, maybe pe people are going to look at me and say, John, you're an idiot for, for falling for that. But like, let, let's do this. I'm excited for this. <laughs> I, that's a, I think that's a really important question. Sure. You, you mentioned we can't update like today. We have the testimonies, but we can update because we can put in testimony one, testimony two, historical considerations, all that jazz. And then once we run out of the historical data, then I would argue that we can actually do modern day miracle accounts, for instance, to update even today. But there's no updating because all of, all of those accounts are from the same sources. The, modern day miracle accounts? Well, modern day miracle accounts have no bearing on whether or not Jesus resurrected. Well, right, right there. Like that, that, his claim right there, I, immediately I was like, that's ridiculous. And then you, you, you show him why it's ridiculous. I would, yeah, I would push back on that because, for instance, if you have a miracle account with an associated Christophany and that Christophany predicts, hey, this per like, go reach out to this person and you're going to be prayed for and you'll be healed of cerebral palsy, which you've had for 30 plus years. You're paraplegic. Um, you have the brain scans to prove it, all this other stuff. It's biologically impossible to be healed. Um, you get prayed for by that type of per that same person. This is a story of Marlene Kleeps. Um, and we can dig into this if you want. Long story short is the religious context of this because she was healed instantaneously, walked. She scored, I think, 40 points higher in her muscular exams, all this other stuff. She was reviewed by a medical board that, for instance, uh, took care of her for the last, I think it was 20 years. I don't remember everything on top of it. We can look at the notes if you want. Um, Did you guys talk more about this Marlene, what was her name? Kleeps. Kleeps. Did you talk more yeah. about her later? Uh, no, we were texting about it today, though. Okay, because I, I, we'll, we'll touch on that in a second. Um, and the long story short is Christophany, religious context, prayed in Jesus' name, and she was healed instantaneously. Walking in today, she's still healthy as a normal person, no brain defects, nothing. And it seems to me like if we conditionalize and say, if this is a genuine miracle claim done in Jesus' name, if Jesus is alive today, you would expect to see something like that, where if Jesus was dead today, something like that is drastically unexpected. So we can update the prior still even today. They're independent accounts. I think it's flawed to presume that a miracle done in Jesus' name, even if confirmed, would in any way increase the likelihood that some other miracle... So I, I think you genuinely asked him a question here that I don't think he's ever been presented with. Like, and that, that's what I'm saying is like, this is where it's like a Hail Mary because like maybe to you, this seems like a very simple argument, but mm -hmm. you, you've, you've presented him as something I don't think he's ever faced, 
right? And I can I can tell by his body language that he's he's very much trying to figure out what you're saying. And maybe it's just him not understanding what's coming across, or maybe him trying to figure out how he could answer this so it, it doesn't make it look ridiculous to not believe in God or, or whatever it is. I, I can't, I'm not a mind reader. I'm not psychoanalysing here, doing a psychoanalysis, but I can tell he's uncomfortable in his body language. You've, you've really presented like a very solid argument here. You presented, we have documentations of people going through Christophanies, right? Or having these events that are related to Jesus. You you presented one, right? But I know there's more, right? Like, like I've yeah, I've, I, I, there's there's a lot of them that I right. We could and, go and over. If, if each one just raises by zero point zero one percent, and I think with the amount that we have, it just keeps raising that probability. And the thing is, these miracles keep happening, and mm -hmm. then there's more testimony. And then if we could just confirm that it's likely that any of these miracles happened, right? Like like her, then it raises the probability that miracles happen in general. Then we can start giving better accounts to like, say, for example, my miracle that I went through, there's nothing I can provide as any evidence that's going to convince anybody except my testimony, right? Or what I went through, right? Or whatever you've gone through in your own miracles. Like mm -hmm. We could start giving a little bit more credit to that. This, this here creates like such a big wormhole in my opinion of like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm boring you, Sam. No, 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 <laughs> you're not boring me. This creates I... <laughs> Such it's my a, first day back from a long trip. No, so. you're good, bro. <laughs> I thought it is. Such, such a big wormhole of like, I, I don't see the skeptic escaping this. Like, and again, I, I, there's probably way smarter people than me yeah, that no, could do that. I, 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 that. There's a reason why I think modern day miracles are like the strongest, arg one of the strongest arguments for Christian theism. And put it back put it in this likelihood ratio like idea right mm -hmm. on a condition that christianity is true i would say that modern day miracles in jesus name within that christian context right the probability of that type of evidence that type of an event happening on the condition christianity is true is either one or is like extremely close to one right and the probability of that type of an event on a condition Christianity is not true is extremely close to zero, if not zero. Yeah, and, and we don't even have to say Christianity. We could just posit a supernatural God. Like, like if yeah. we really want to be skeptical with it. Like the, yeah, but I want to connect this to the, re to the resurrection specifically. That's yeah. why, like, the miracle that I brought up here had an associated Christophany. Like, it, like when, if you look at the account of Marlene Cleves, um she had it like she, Jesus appeared to her um, and showed her an image of a man in a pinstripe suit. Um, and there's all, there's other stuff I didn't like talk about. Um, and in that image, he showed her uh, an image of a girl riding a bike in a yellow dress. And um, off the top of my head, I can't remember the, like how it came about, but like a specific date, I was like March 18th, 1980 something mm. came, to, came to mind too. Um, and then a day later and that, that for that date, God told her, this is when you'll be healed. Um, and that man in the pinstripe suit is when you'll be healed. And then she found out that, and then she like figured out that girl on the, on the bike in the yellow dress was actually her. A few days later, a friend of hers, um, without any sort of like communication about the, the dress or anything like that actually sent her a yellow dress. Um, so like that was one thing for her. And then long story short, the guy in the pinstripe suit, they actually contacted him by complete coincidence um, because March 18th came along and she heard God say like, Hey, don't fret. I'm still going to heal you. Go find the, lo the local pastor or something like that. And mm -hmm. so, she called man with the pinstripe suit, exactly that like stature and everything showed up. They brought her to his church. They're not a charismatic church. Um, according to the reports, she was prayed for healed all this other stuff. You get the point prayed in Jesus name, all that. But the significance is there's an associated Christophany. There's an appearance of Jesus. Right. And like, it's in a specific, it's in a uniquely Christian context that this is right. happening in that that Christian context really like is really important here. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree with you, man. I'm just saying th this, this is really good. Anyways, let, let's, let's finish yeah. this. Um, 
and then we'll, we'll cut it off. Account was confirmed. They have to be independent. Yeah, of course, we have one because we have no way of knowing uh, that they're connected. There's well, a presumption I, they're connected. I've established the connection sort of here because like connection I said, has similar beliefs. Well, no, because I'm saying if Jesus rose from the dead and he's still active in the world today, you would expect to see miracles done in Jesus' name with associated Christophanies. I, I don't know that we necessarily expect that, but even whether or not Jesus rose from the dead is independent of whether or not there's a God that does miracles. Right, but I'm just conditionalizing here. I'm using conditional probability. So I'm saying if Jesus is if Jesus is God and he rose from the dead, then I would expect to see this. Much like, for instance, if we have transitional fossils and um, we want to say, well, what explains this? Well, if some sort of process like evolution was true, I would expect to see transitional fossils. But the existence of one transitional fossil doesn't tell you about anything at all about the existence of some other transitional form. We could be completely wrong about whales starting as mammals and returning to the sea and, and whether or not, and if the discovery of tectolic doesn't prove anything about any other thing, what it does is it increases um, the probability of a particular model. Of, of the model. Yeah. But you don't have a model and the model is independent of whether or not Jesus resurrected. I'm talking about whether or not, is it, the, the question of the debate was, is it a historical fact that Jesus... And see, and, and this is not me throwing shade at Matt by any means. He, he's, he's really grasping at straws here. Like, I don't, I don't really feel like he comprehends fully what you're saying. And, it, and like, he's trying to make the claim that these are not connected to each other. But that's the crux of your whole argument is that they have to be. Yeah. And, and to be fair, um, I probably could have worded it better because I wasn't planning on talking about that during the debate. I, I don't think you really did it poorly. Like I, I got it right away and I'm, I'm a buffoon. Um, I was talking to our mutual friend. He got it right away. Right. Like, oh yeah. Like a lot of this picked up on like chat, just anybody who's watching right now. Did you guys understand what Than was saying when he said it? Let's just do like a quick poll on that. Let it, let us know if you understood. Cause I feel like it was clear now. Granted, that doesn't mean Matt's an idiot by any means. He could have just been like, we all had the moments where somebody's explaining something to us and we're just like, oh, I don't get it. And it's really simple. But yeah, I, I think this was really good. I'm going to pull up How your TikTok stream to see what people think. So uh, Alexis says, um, now nah, I'm stupid. And I literally lit up when he talked oh. about it. <laughs> How it happened, whether there's a God. I watched the debate a while ago. I understood fully, uh, pretty clear. Uh, yes, but I'm an active Christian and apologetic, so my understanding is skewed. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Okay. It's completely irrelevant. But even if there's a God that maybe, if there's a God that performs miracles, even in the name of Jesus, that's completely independent from whether or not that God actually raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah, that's kind of the whole point of my argument, though, I feel like, right? We, I'm giving a conditional probability. I'm not assuming God exists. I'm not saying this proves God exists. I'm saying conditional on this hypothesis, I would expect to see these things. Yeah, but now we're back to assuming there's a God that does miracle, we would expect to see these things. But the issue, that's the wrong question. The question is, if we see this on someone recovering, on that evidence, what is the probability that this was done by God? And what is the probability that that's the same God that also happened to resurrect Jesus? Yeah, and, and so now here's where I think he's finally connecting the dots, and I think he's giving like a proper rebuttal. Like you're saying, if God exists, if Jesus is God, we would expect to see these things. Well, he's saying you don't start there. He's saying you see these things, and then you ask, what's the probability that that was God in the first place? That's what he's trying to come back with, I think. Yeah. 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 And I would say it's a lot higher given the religious context and given the. Now, so here are the options, at least by my lights, when it comes to the miracle, miracle concept of this. Um, Give him 20. <laughs> here, here are the options. Um, either it's someone on natural law, um, God did it, some, some sort of divine intervention, or the report was mistaken. In, in the case of Marlene Cleaves, um, I would really discount the mistaken by my medical documentation. And so we're left with those other two options, most likely, which is someone on natural law or divine inter intervention. Um, if we do some unknown natural law, I think that would actually undermine all the, a lot of the stuff that we know about science, because if there's some unknown natural law that can do something that's we, that we've deemed biologically possible, then what do we actually know about the natural laws that we do know today? Not much, which is why there are all sorts of things that get claimed to be miracles on a regular basis. Remission is claimed by, to be a miracle from almost everybody who has a theistic view of miracles, and yet the scientific explanation is we don't know. But the point you're making here, correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, science is not, doesn't know what happened here. Well, so so the point I'm trying to make here is is an is like an epi is um almost like a reductio type move, right? Because mm -hmm. theoretically, you could posit some unknown natural law to explain this, right? Um, and so like, in specifically in this context, I'm doing a reductio, I'm just saying, look, if you want to say there is some unknown that if you really want to postulate postulate that, 
these are the repercussions of saying that. For the sake of the chat, uh, reductio ad absurdum, absurdum is like, if you take this thing to the full conclusion, what is the outcome of the world that we live in? That, that's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying, like, look, if there is some sort of unknown natural law that goes against everything else we know about natural laws when it comes to people that have this condition, right? Um, and what's possible and that's what's not possible, given what we know already about the world, right? Postulating this thing that goes against everything else undercuts our knowledge about everything else. Um, and, and it also kind of kind of smuggles in the science of the gaps uh, idea, I think, personally. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that because if you stay within the framework, right? If you stay within this Bayesian framework and you're saying like, well, here, here's a hypothesis to consider, right? I don't consider that a science of the gaps. No, no, but I, I'd say like you could say everything we know about science says this is impossible, right? That, and that's the argument you're making. Yeah. So if you want to bring to that full conclusion, then you have to say we know nothing about science. And you could you could do that and you could say, well, there is some sort of natural explanation, but I don't know what it is, but eventually we'll figure it out and we'll rewrite all of science. You could do that literally forever, but that's not- Well, yeah, really the other thing, point. yeah, the other thing I can just do, right, is just like I can parody that even I can even parody parody that with evidence for the resurrection and evidence for God. Yeah. Right. Well, we don't have enough evidence right now to prove it, but you know what? We, we will at some point at the eschaton, right? Like, yeah. Um, that's not terribly helpful. No, I, I agree. At some point you gotta, you gotta come to a conclusion and then you have to update. If there's new information, you update your conclusions. Yep. Yeah. And I'm saying the theistic explanation is that's going to be time after his answer. All right. We are going to move into the final portion. Yeah, so oh, I, was I, I, I biffed on the clothing. I already know that. I was just riding the high of having a really good conversation with Matt. <laughs> I, I don't think you did. I th I, I'm just cutting the Q&A because it's almost three in the morning. That, well, fair that's enough, the only yeah. reason. I, we'd still go through it. Um, I didn't expect this to take this long, by the way. I thought we'd be live for like Nah, dude, I'm fine. An How, hour long and a half. How long do we go? Uh, so... Uh, Almost four hours, geez. Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate I appreciate you coming on and doing that, uh, like a lot, yeah. man. Um, let's let's open up for questions if people have it, real quick, and then then we'll call it a night. Uh, Timothy cool. says, "Did you ever press him on what he would bet on if he had to make an educated guess on what happened with the resurrection?" Actually, I think that's a good question. Um, I did a little bit. Um, well, because I because I because I told him like, look given new testament reliability these are three options resurrection mistaken or lying um and it seemed like his answer was saying like some sort of like mistaken hypothesis whether that's a hallucination or some other family of mistaken hypotheses is what he thinks is most likely um or maybe he think more uh, like or, or maybe a combination of the two who knows uh, victor says can someone send me a link uh, or what to search up to find some of these modern miracles. Uh, is it Craig Keener? Craig Keener's book? Craig Keener has a book. Yeah. Um, I have some. I have an interview with... Um, let me pull it up quick. Uh, Chris Gunderson, I think his name is. If you go to like my channel and you find the... Um, go under like the live section. And then if you just keep scrolling, um, the thumbnail says interview with a real miracle case and then the title is a medically documented miracle case uh, i'll put it in the chat and the youtube okay um and this is a guy interview got medical documentation and everything is um that, was is that the guy born... who gets crushed no. no this guy was born with um gastroparesis and he was being fed through a j and g tube in his stomach for his whole life wow he was prayed for um and heard a voice i think telling him to like eat through his mouth instead of through the feeding tube um the doc and then he was eating through the tube the doctor was like holy crap that's not possible and yeah wow um can y'all pray for my stupidity and my memory those are two things i want people to pray for i want to hear make that double double for me too yeah for his his memory um all right, guys, a uh, chance for questions for anybody in the chat if you want to do that. Now is the point. If not, we're going to shut it down. Make sure you give them money. And give me money. Um, it's a good point to kind of segue. Guys, go follow Than. <laughs> Than over here, Exploring Reality. Go follow him. Uh, just Exploring Reality, right? All one word? 
Yeah. On YouTube. Oh, no. It's two words. Two Exploring words. reality. Um, so go do that and go support him on Patreon as well. And then support me on Patreon because if not, you don't get to see this handsome face every every night when we go live. Um, my links are in the bo- in below, right? I don't know where your links are, but I'm assuming it's somewhere. You have a Patreon, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we got some more questions coming in now. How come Jesus didn't know the fig tree was in season? Um, I don't, so, oh gosh, I dug into this a while ago. Um, if you want to know my answer to this, Michael Heiser, um, reviews this. I'd forget where, but I'm sure if you just like YouTube searched Michael Heiser fig tree, um, you'll, you'll find it. And there's a lot of like, there's a lot of speculation as to what's going on here. Um, whether or not this is like a literal account, all this other stuff. There's some ancient narration backdrops going on. So um, I would recommend watching that Heiser video on it. Uh, I don't really have my mind completely made up on what's going on with this passage, though. So I don't want to give an answer. Um, I think he's just teaching. but Yeah. Uh, do you think the arguments based on infinite time and KCA, KCA are good arguments or are flawed? Um, so I lean on accepting arguments for causal finitism. So like this idea that there can't be an infinite progression of like moments or causes and events. Um, but I can see where people are coming from when it comes to these debates. Um, and so I don't really defend the Kalam cosmological argument that much. Uh, what about motion? As- what? What about uh, Thomas Aquinas for motion? Same. I don't. I don't really defend any of those because my 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 nat my apologetic project, or what I would call my natural theology project, is to leave as many options open as possible. And so, like, I think, for instance, um, even if the universe is eternal, uh, I still think there's a net. Like, it, it needs a necessary being to ground it. Um, or for it to be sustained. And so I try not to spend too much time in things that can go up in the air and like are relevant, but there's things that are more important. And so I'm so offended right now because the argument for motion is my favorite. I love I it. I mean, yeah. I mean, like by all means, keep using it. Right. My project, you're not going to stop. That, me. Just, that just means your project is a little bit different than mine. Right. Mine is like, look, whether or not you believe the universe began to exist or not, I still think you need to believe in a God, right? That's my project. We, and we can maybe do another live on that one day. Um, I'll answer this one. What are the four or five main points that uh, Than had for validity of the resurrection that he gave at the beginning? Easy. Just rewind to the beginning. <laughs> Lo- love you, bro. <laughs> um Seems like Matt believes 1 Corinthians 15, 14. Why not the rest of the Bible? You want to answer that? or I don't remember what that is. I don't memorize Bible verses. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 14. I don't remember that is either. No, you're, you're good, CopyCon. I'm just teasing you, bro. Um, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is... Oh, that one. Okay. Um, I mean, I feel like that's just a really easy thing to agree to even if you don't think that the bible is reliable or anything like that because we're we're saying this happened and our eternity rests on it so you could come to that conclusion even independent of what first corinthians says Uh, why is jesus necessary if god is real by canada os yeah so it depends on how you're using the word necessary here um but I would just say, like, again, if you look at the beginning of the video, I kind of actually gave some reasons why God would choose to do things the way he did things, um, which is become incarnate, take it like take on human flesh and provide atonement um, and defeat death on our behalf. Like, so if you look through the opening statement, I kind of answer that question a little bit. Um, and there's other reasons why you might even go into. But 
I don't know that we have the time to go into them right now for this type of a Q&A setting. Uh, I would recommend, if you're really into analytic philosophy, there's a philosopher named Joshua Sijuade. Um, and he writes, what? Sijuade is so hard to read. I know. He's so That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. If you're into analytic philosophy, he has a video, he has a paper titled The Necessity of an Incarnate Prophet that's like a home run. Um, did do you do you agree with him on trope theory with the with um no but well okay let me let me back that up i don't i don't hold myself to any particular model as you know that yeah so like i i agree that his trope theory is a really good model of god um but i just don't hold to it fair enough um have either of you heard of mary neal and her nde slash miracle i have not have you I haven't either. Um, I'm really skeptical of the value of near death of NDEs. Um, oh, just, I, I disagree what? with you. Oh, really? Yeah. We should talk about that some other time then for sure. Well, I, I could touch on it real quick, but finish what you're going to say. Yeah. Um, but if there's an associated miracle with it, then I would actually value the NDE. Um, so it depends on what's going on here. So I, I'll just touch on it real quick. There's a paper uh, that was put out about NDEs. It's a, it's a recent one that showed, and, and it's very, very small studies group, but it points in that direction. It shows that when people were having NDE experiences, that the brainwaves they're showing was the, the gamma, beta, delta, theta, and alpha brainwaves, which are all the ones that we would expect to see when somebody's having a legitimate experience. There are different brainwaves that fire when somebody's having like a uh, hallucination or if they're under drugs or if they're dreaming. There's things that fire in the synapses that are different. And this paper shows that these people who are deeply dead and they were in cardiac arrest, I can find it and send it to you. I have it somewhere if you, if you haven't read it. Yeah, send it over. Yeah, they, they were like um, in cardiac arrest for hours. We're showing to have these um, brain, this brain activity of a real experience. And then they came back and reported the NDE experiences. And they were all very similar. The problem, and they openly admit this in this paper, is the study group is very small. And the reason the study group is small is because a lot of people died that they were studying because th that's the problem in the study. Group. It's really hard to get um, a lot of people who come back in the process of dying. So, yeah. but it, it's something to take. I, I wouldn't say it's like not don't take it seriously. I wouldn't use it as an evidence, but I'd say it's something that we could look at for sure. Yeah, yeah. no, for sure. Um, send me that paper. Like I said, I'm mainly just skeptical of how valuable they are fair enough um all right guys that's it for the question so we're gonna call it a night uh than thank you so much for doing this and yeah. explaining what happened uh like i said we're all very proud of you and what you've done so keep doing it keep growing uh reaching out to the people and last I, I don't know since i've known you you've you've grown quite a bit now you've you know you're in touch with ip you're on his channel and you're doing debates with matt dillahunty i think you're on the right trajectory man i think god's supporting you so uh, i think it's very cool and yeah, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I'm just going to address the chat real quick. You can stick around if you want. We'll chat for a minute after. But guys, thank you so much for watching and, uh, you know, being a part of this. Uh, one thing I got to say is I really appreciate your guys' patience with me, right? Um, sometimes I'm not always live because technical issues, things like that. And tonight we were live at everything set up and it was a mess. But you guys stuck around and you watched even though it was a mess. So I appreciate that, that you do that. Uh, as always, if you want to support, make sure that you please hit the subscribe button, hit the like icon, uh, follow me on all platforms. TikTok, if you're following me on TikTok, go follow me on YouTube. Do those things. Uh, I should see just as many people here tonight, just as many likes when we log off. It's really easy, very simple to do. And again, if you want to support me, you want to support my ministry, uh, please make sure that you do that on Patreon because if you don't do it on Patreon, I can't do this. And, and it's you know, I hate asking. You guys know I hate asking, but it's part of the gig. Uh, by you guys doing that, I'm able to do these lives, conversations, conversations with Than, the debates on TikTok, make videos, things like that. So greatly appreciate it. You guys know where to find all the links, and we will see you all next time. God bless and have.